All right. Well, that's me. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is January 26, 2022, and the time is 9.30. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. And there are a couple of different ways to follow the meeting or participate in the meeting today. To both view and participate, I recommend using the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. Please dial 1-669-900-6833 to call in. The collaboration code for today's meeting is 818-3690-0947. This information is also posted on the top of the planning department page. All right, a couple of instructions about providing comment today during the public hearing. For each agendized public hearing item, time will be provided for members of the public to um, contribute their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on your telephone. Members of the public will be provided three, min uh, three minutes to speak. If at any time you have difficulty connecting to, to today's meeting via the Zoom link or calling in via telephone, please email Michael Lamb, our support staff at michael.lamb, that's L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. He will be checking his email periodically throughout the meeting and is on standby ready to assist you if you have difficulty connecting today. All right, it appears we are situated. I see we have a full commission here with us today. I will now turn it over to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Chair Gordon. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, welcome everyone to the January 26, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Planning Commission. And the time is now 9.33 and we'll call this meeting to order. Can we please have a roll call? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? And oh, sorry. I'm here. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Dan? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda, Ms. Drake? Uh, no, not today. Okay, great, thank you. Um, moving on to item three, declarations of ex parte communications. Do we have any from the commissioners? Okay, hearing none, we can move on to item four of our agenda today, oral communications. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, but Ms. Lazenby oh, had her Ms. Lazenby had her hand up. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I emailed a question to one of the objectors who had sent in um, correspondence. I did not get a response, but that might be considered ex parte. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any others? All right, now to item four, <clears throat> excuse me, oral communications. Now's the time when the public has the opportunity to speak uh, on items that are not on today's agenda. So Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that would like to talk at this time? All right, I will check in with our attendee list. Um, again, this is a time to raise your hand if you would like to speak on an item not on today's agenda. 
And if that is the case, um, we will call on you to speak. You would have two minutes, two minutes to speak. Um, I. I'll second that. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstaining? Great. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Drake, I just got a notification that the recording has stopped. I'm not sure if that's something that we need to take a minute and figure out. I saw that as well. So thank you for pausing. I was just going to follow up with that with our CTV. Recording hosts. in progress. So um, there it goes. Ms. Drake, would you like us to re vote so that it's on the record as well, while it's recorded? Would that be helpful for you? Um, let me check in with uh, with our staff, our CTV staff, just a moment. Okay. Yes, let's, I'm sorry, we do need to retake that vote, Chair Gordon. No I'm not sure exactly where it cut off, so we'll just kind of repeat the whole section there. Uh, item number five, the approval of minutes uh, from the January 12th hearing. Is that a motion? Uh, I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan, and there is a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. All in favor, say aye. 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 And any opposed? And any abstaining? Great. The motion passes again. Um, let's move on then to the next regularly scheduled um, item. This is item number six, application 201372. This is the appeal of the zoning administrator of approval of a new wireless communication facility located at 675 Rebecca Drive in Boulder Creek. Um, um, yes. Sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I was going to ask if we could please promote Sheila as a panelist so she can make her presentation. All right. And we can go ahead and load the PowerPoint. Good morning, Sheila. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, good morning. Thank you, I'm sorry. My name is Sheila McDaniel, Santa Cruz County Planning Department. Before I start my presentation, I just wanted to inform your commission that there's been a flurry of late communications. We have um, a revised landscape plan prepared by Helix um, Environmental, dated January 21st, provided by the applicant with updated landscape um, recommendations and site plan. And we have uh, communications from Rob Mann, the one of the appellants with uh, corresponding arborist recommendations for that landscaping plan that was submitted um, yesterday. And then we also have communications from Michael Tunick representing um, the other appellant, Robinson. 
and um, I will be speaking to some of those items during my presentation. So the proposed facility is a replacement wireless facility of an existing permitted wireless facility at 653 Rebecca Drive. The project proposes to fill a significant gap in wireless coverage created by um, decommission, if you will, or um, demolition of the wireless communication facility there. Next slide, please. The property is located at the end of the cul-de-sac on Rebecca Drive in a rural residential neighborhood in the hills above and southeast of Boulder Creek and northeast of Brookdale. Next slide, please. The parcel is on residential agriculture and mountain residential within the general plan. The use is allowed pursuant to the residential uses chart under 1310.322, subject to an alternative analysis. The zoning administrator staff report includes the alternative analysis that evaluated potential facility locations in the Rebecca Drive neighborhood, as well as other sites at similar elevations to ensure that existing coverage uh, to existing AT&T customers is not compromised by the replacement of the current facility. The applicant identified the subject property as the only site available to fill the significant gap created by closure of the existing facility. Next, please. The project site location is shown as the star located to the southwest of the existing tree in the photo. The man's residence, one of the appellants, is located to the west of the subject property or to your left, left of the project site. The Robinsons, the other appellant, lives to the east of the subject property to the right. Next photo, please. So this is a drone photo provided by the applicant very early in the project, which I felt provided the best vantage point. Um, I had a very difficult time taking photos of the project for your commission. So as you can see, the subject property is 675 Rebecca Drive. That has the trees located there. The proposed wireless facility at 675 um, is located outside a sensitive habitat. And it, the property contains two uh, slope stability, a slope stability analysis and a geotechnical engineering report, both accepted by environmental planning subject to conditions of approval. The site is considered stable. The man's residence, as I noted, is to the left at 655 Rebecca Drive. Um, I thought it would be important to note that the man's bought the property following real estate disclosure of the proposed facility, including a location map of the project. So they were aware when they purchased the property that the facility was going to go at 675 Rebecca Drive. The Robinson's residence, as you can see, is located to the east. And you can also see in this slide the existing Robinson facility, wireless facility, is to be removed. And it will be replaced at 675. Next slide, please. So the project proposes a platform lease area, approximately 290 square feet in area, approximately 10 by 29 feet, between four to eight feet above existing grade. And the grade is sloped at this location with six 12 foot tall pan antennas mounted to, a plat to the platform structure, six AT&T antennas and six T-Mobile antennas um, attached to the mounts. A four foot wide stairway is proposed along the west side of the facility. A generator is not proposed and cannot be required by the county. Next slide, please. So elevation draws overall, the height is proposed a maximum of approximately 16 to 20 feet above existing grade to the top of the antennas. From the upper grade elevation height is approximately 16 feet. At the lower grade elevation, facility height is approximately 20 feet. Uh, this complies with the maximum 28 foot height allowed by the zone district. Next slide, please. So I have provided you an existing and proposed site conditions. The upper photo again shows the existing conditions, so you have a reference. The lower photo shows the proposed visual simulation highlighting the location of the proposed project. It should be noted that the access to facility is actually on the west side. That was a very early representation, but it's generally in the correct location. No public views 
of the project are avail available from Rebecca Drive due to the shrouded vegetation there. And at the bottom right is the existing facility. You can see that will be proposed to be removed. Can you hear me? Yes. Could I just ask, how do you get to that again? Let to see. It's on Rebecca Drive. Which is, are you showing Rebecca Drive here? You, Rebecca Drive is a cul-de-sac located behind that group of redwood trees. There's no visible um, sight distance from the end of the cul-de-sac to the proposed location. The only potential views of the project are from both appellants, east and west of the property. So, but I mean, how will they get down on that slope to oh, build it? There's, there's access from Rebecca Drive as a parking space at the top. So with we, just, it. we just can't see it. You can't see it. There's a, there's a stairway access that goes down the hill from the top of the slope. And then what I just wanted to ask, I might as well ask it now, where are the code violations that are still extant? Okay, so the code violations are on the um, Robinson property to the right in the lower photo. They were a result of um, grading violations, vacation rentals, um, gosh, it's been almost two decades of code violations. There's an active code case um, and stipulation for rectification of these violations. And so, then, so if you look at the fencing along the driveway of the Robinson property, the code violations in that general area, there's some, some erosion and drainage issues caused from um, grading in that location. It's further down, it's probably to the right of where the proposed facility is along the roadway. So none of those code violations have been cleaned up or resolved? No, they're outstanding violations. There's five open code violations that prevent the county from issuing building permits for ongoing maintenance and repair and update, upgrade to the facility um, at the Robinson property. Will the conditions of the code violations in regard to erosion, et cetera, impact this facility. No, they, not it's. no, the environmental planning staff accepted the slope stability analysis on the subject property as well as the um, geotechnical report and they've noted that um, erosion issues on the Robinson property are unrelated to slope stability on the subject property. And the Robinsons have continuously owned this property. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Okay, so and as you noted, um, Commissioner Shepard, um, the Robinson facility is non-viable and technically infeasible for these reasons that we discussed. On November 19th, the zoning administrator approved the application with added conditions of approval to require landscape screening trees between the proposed facility and the property to the west, uh, the man's property to the left of the, in the photo, and to require that the existing facility be decommissioned within six months of operation of the proposed facility. Um, this has appeared to cause some confusion, but decommissioned is meant to mean relocating the equipment from the existing facility to the new facility, shutting down power to the existing facility, and then removal of the existing facility and restoration of the existing site as required by the uh, use approval for the Robinson property. Um, on December 2nd, an appeal was filed by Rob Mann. Does somebody have a question? I, where was the fence that was taken down? Okay, so if you look in the upper photo, we can look at both photos, the upper photo, you see the redwood fence um, to mm -hmm. the left of the Robinson house. You mean right by that big shrubby tree thing? Yes, that, that fence was removed after the public zoning administrator approved the project. It was there until after project approval. And what? From your being on the site, that that fence benefits the Robinsons. View basically has nothing to do with the man's, really, right? That's correct. And was that a legally erected fence? It's eight feet in height. Eight foot high fences do not require a building permit, um, so they're principally permitted. Um, and except your... to say, I'm not aware if the fence was part of an erosion issue caused by drainage or something. So 
Um, I can't speak to that issue, but fences by themselves are allowed to be constructed without approval. Right. Now, if that fence were still there, how would it, how would it in your estimation, impact the visibility of the proposed facility? Well, when I did my analysis, I did spend a lot of time out there looking at it. Um, and I was under the understanding from the applicant that the Robinsons wouldn't give them access to provide any visual simulation evaluation. So I did the best I could to evaluate it and did, you know, debated with myself about how much screening would be provided by the fence and concluded that screening would be improved with that fence location from portions of the dwelling um, in that area and that it would minimize views of that. Um, however, the appellant has since you know, provided some visual simulations based on the mock-up provided by the applicant, um, showing and some pictures from their property showing that their views may be greater than what I had um, understood based on the information available to me. Um, but I think that's addressed by the landscaping plan that I'll go into shortly. Okay, and just one more question. The facility to be removed has been leased to the um, cell phone uh, companies by the Robinsons, right? Yes, so it's my understanding that the Robinsons are leasing that space to Crown Castle, and Crown Castle's acting as the um, head leaseholder with lease subleases to AT&T and T-Mobile for their wireless antennas. And given, um, you know, I guess you could say a fractured relationship, they um, are no longer, the site's no longer um, tenable for them besides the fact that there's some outstanding violations that make it non-viable as well. So, I mean, the applicant can go into that, but um, that's essentially the reason this application is going forward is that this project, the existing site is no longer tenable. And who exactly owns the property that the proposed facility is on? Okay, so the proposed facility is owned by the Reddingtons, and it's been a lot of conversation about this. So the Mans are located to the west, and they bought the property. The Reddingtons also owned that property prior to the purchase by the Mans appellants. So they were put on notice when they purchased the property that the wireless facility was being proposed on the, the Reddington's other property. They were even provided a copy of the site location map um, of the facility. So they were made readily aware as part of purchase. It, it looks from the photo, and I'd like, again, your experience of having been there, that the man's visibility of the proposed facility is limited. That is true. I mean, however, you know, the MANS did provide um, what they thought were um, based on the site elevations. They went out there and took some mm -hmm. photos, of, uh, put their own little mock-up, if you will, photos provided. I, I actually think they did a fair assessment of what their impacts would be. And okay. um, the applicant did uh, provide the mock-up and then visual simulations, which I think really um, confirmed the MANS uh, suspected uh, visual impact. And uh, as I indicated, it would be limited due to screening. However, there are some views and I um, will get into the landscape plan detail, which I think will f uh, fully screen the, the remaining man's views of the facility, as well as the screening to the Robinsons, even though they didn't indicate they had a visual impact issue initially. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. All right, so moving along. So following approval of the project on December 2nd, the MANS filed, I know, can we go back, please? So the, the MANS filed an appeal on December 2nd and a subsequent second appeal was filed by Tunic Law Firm representing David Robinson. Um, fundamentally, the issues are the alternative analysis didn't include the existing 653 Rebecca Drive as, as a viable op um, option. Um, questions regarding the, what was considered confusing, the decommission condition regarding what exactly that meant, and visual impact assessment um, from 655 um, Rebecca Drive wasn't provided. So as well as some other issues related to RF, heat emission information requested at the public hearing. Um, so next slide, please. 
So the basis of approval, I'm going to go through the item one first, and then we'll move into two and then three. So we're starting with the alternative analysis. Um, the alternative analysis determined that there was a significant gap in coverage created by the loss of the existing facility on the Robinson property. Um, the appellants alleged that the alternative analysis does not evaluate 653, um, but they didn't provide any evidence other than saying that um, the, the owner is a willing leaseholder for continued operation of the facility. Um, but as um, Commissioner Shepard and questioned, there are five open code and active code violations on the property that prohibit issuance of building permits for ongoing maintenance and um, upgrades, as well as access what has been blocked to the uh, carriers um, by the property owner as represented by the applicant. And these factors establish the facility as a non-viable and technically infeasible site location. And the county really can't require the wireless carrier to to maintain operation of facility with ongoing unresolved uh, violations or untenable leasehold circumstances that compromise the wireless service. So it was kind of a given that this site is non-viable, but for the record, it's non-viable and technically infeasible. So the, the alternative analysis determined that there are no other sites that are viable, technically feasible, equivalent, or environmentally superior, and that the subject property is the only site that will meet the significant gap in coverage, and that alternative analysis has been accepted as part of the project approval by the zoning administrator. So with regard to item two, when evaluating wireless facilities, visual impacts are evaluated from public viewpoints. There are no perceptible visual impacts to public views. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to point out to your commission that the wireless ordinance requires visual simulations from various locations on and or angles from which the public would typically view the site. It doesn't require visual simulations from private views as the appellants have alleged. Visual simulations included in the zoning administrator staff report demonstrate compliance with protection of visual impacts from public roadways. The following visual simulations that I'll be providing you show there are no perceptible visual impacts as you can see designed and camouflaged and painted green, you, you wouldn't even notice it. In fact, you would be trying to maintain your, your car on the roadway. If you drive on Highway 9, you know that. Um, so slide one shows views from Highway 9, and then slide two, next please. The second photo is taken from Brookdale Lodge. Again, as you can see, you can barely see it. And then slide three. Next slide. Yeah, this inadvertently, I inadvertently put the first slide in twice, and I apologize for that, but your packet includes slide three, and it's similar in its views. They're imperceptible. And I did want to add that the late correspondence provided by Robinson's um, attorney, Tunick, provided photos of the mock-up from public roadways that reflect the scaffold and not the socked and tenants that are painted green, um, which as you can see are imperceptible. Next slide, please. So getting back to the basis for approval, um, we're on item three. Um, the wireless ordinance requires that wireless facilities be situated to minimize visual impacts and where visible to surrounding properties be designed to be camouflaged. So a determination that the project minimizes visual impacts does not mean that the facility is required to be invisible to surrounding private property. So that's often the issue here is the neighbors. Obviously, you know, we're very concerned about protecting um, property views for wireless from wireless facilities. But the test is not can you see it? The test is has it been minimized? It, um, and in that, in that regard, the project has been located on site to minimize the loss of RF coverage so that it has to meet the coverage objective under the federal law. And it, insofar as it meets the coverage objective at the location of the site has been minimized, minimizes visual impacts to the two adjacent homes by one location as far down the slope as feasible to preclude private views as much as feasible. So that's, a, that's the best we're going to get on that in that regard in meeting the RF objectives. 
and then otherwise it's been designed to include antenna socks to camouflage this vegetation with natural green color to blend into the background landscaping. And then the prov uh, providing landscaping to eventually fully screen from both appellants. So there's additional landscaping that is the applicants provided in the packet in your commission that I think will fully screen the facility in a period of years and it won't be an eyesore to either property owner. Next, please. So now this, the so the mock-up was provided by the applicant and then he provided visual simulations of the proposed facility. So the upper, upper photos show without screening so you can see the facility and the lower photos show what the, what the neighbor would see. This is property views from the man's residence to the west. So as you can see, it does glimpse um, views of the proposed project. I did not include all the visual simulations. So if you need to look at, would like to look at the rest, there's a couple more in the, the PC packet. So it should be noted that zoning administrator addressed the man's concern at the hearing by adding a condition of approval requiring the additional screening in the form of tree planting along the western side of the facility. So during the hearing, Mr. Mann agreed to coordinate with the project applicant in identifying the exact placement of the required landscaping trees prior to issu issuance of the building permit. So the zoning administrator thought that he was satisfied um, with that condition um, and the applicant agreed to coordinate with him to finalize that location of landscaping. So following the zoning administrator hearing, the mock-up was placed. So your commission it, um, could see it on site during your site visit. And then these simulations are provided that provide potential views here. So with location design and color, the project is in compliance with the wireless code to minimize visual impacts to surrounding properties. Next, please. So your packet, your packet contains, now to be clear, your packet contains yeah. landscape plans provided by environmental, Helix Environmental dated January 14th. That's in your actual packet. The applicant, um, the neighbor, the man's provided a letter um, indicating that he didn't think that the plan reflected the current plan and I, I agreed with him, forwarded that to the applicant. Um, as you can see, the stairway is on the left side. This is the updated screening plan. So the applicant provided a corrected plan dated January 21st. That's it in this slide and in your late correspondence. Okay, so I just wanna be clear about that. So the landscape plan in your packet recommended three species on the west side and two species on the east. The updated plan you see here ref reflects two species providing protection of views to the man's and one species to the right providing protection of views to the Robinsons. And your packet includes the arborist recommended trees and shrubs native to the area located to the northwest of the platform and then to the uh, east of the platform. Just for quick reference, what page is that on? Oh gosh. I mean, it's a big packet. If you don't know it, I don't want to slow you down. But does the landscape plan involve planting them and then making sure they get irrigated for a year or something? Yes, the recommended uh, landscape plan includes irrigation until established. Okay, um, that, that's all I wanted to know. Okay, so. I did want to I did want to highlight that the man's provided their own arborist letter that was provided to you probably yesterday evening or this morning as late correspondence that um, with they're recommending that they have a more a collaborative plan prepared um, providing species that might grow faster. Their arborist is recommending redwood trees. I, I staffed it. I don't really have a uh, any objections to a collaborative plan um, to to address the appellant's um, concerns about ensuring landscape screening? If we wanted, if we were favorable to a collaborative plan, would the um, 
would this need amending to allow that? Or so yeah, not? so so my recommendation, I hadn't decided because it came so late, I hadn't decided what I would recommend to your commission. So I prepared a revised condition that would reflect a collaborative plan before building permit issuance and that your commission can consider following testimony. So I have a condition ready for you. I'm going to recommend that the planting plan that's provided by the applicant just as an opportunity to starting point. And if your commission would like to um, revise that, I have some language for you to address the um, man's concerns. And I think we'll, everybody will be satisfied, but I didn't want to make that a recommendation until the public testimony. So you're all comfortable with the, you know, the decision before you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so then again, I just wanted to point out, so that's with regard to the man's um, visual impacts. And then so with regard to the Robinsons, um, the Robinsons or the, their attorney, the two, um, Michael Tunick, did not provide any oral testimony or written testimony questioning or, you know, had any concerns regarding visual impacts. Um, and then following the zoning administrator approval, they removed the, the eight foot solid board fence along their property line. And then, but I did wanted to point out, like I said earlier, that Mr. Tunick provided late correspondence noting views of the proposed mock-up from his residents, from the Robinson residents, a group of, of, of visuals, photos, which I, I would have had the benefit of, would have been nice, to be honest with you, if that had been provided or that had been made available, um, but the applicant was prohibited from access. so. That wasn't available to me, but it does reflect, I think, um, if you look at that late correspondence, you'll get a good sense of what their views are from their decking and their, their areas. However, given the low height at 20 feet, the proposed improvements will be fully screened quite easily by the proposed landscaping in this, in this photo here. Um, and so again, I just wanted to point out to your commission that you could decide to require the applicant to reconstruct the fencing if you wanted. I, staff's not going to recommend that since they took that out on their own uh, following the decision, um, but it's an op it's option for you. So with the location design and color of the project is in compliance with the wireless code to minimize visual impacts to surrounding properties. And so with regard to remaining appeal issues, um, you know, obviously, I, I took it to heart that, you know, the appellant had a valid point about decommissioning, you know, lacks definition. So your the conditions of approval in the staff report have been clearly articulated to clarify what that means. So the condition in the language, um, condition 3F has been stricken. And there's proposed language, which would allow the new facility to operate until the old facility is permanently deactivated and um, which allows the building official to shut off power to um, the new facility in the event of non-compliance with the required deactivation of 653 um, Rebecca Drive. And then also another condition is proposed, which would require that within six months of the issuance of the temporary certificate of occupancy prior to final, the applicant shall obtain a demo permit for the removal and site restoration of the existing facility at the Robinson property. And that this condition of approval reflects the lease terms between the Robinson and Crown Castle that already require Crown Castle to demolish the site um, upon decommissioning or removal and to restore the site to the pre-construction condition. So that, that language, I think, clarifies that nicely. The conditions of approval for the Robinson already have that language in there. So I kind of it would have gone without saying unless they brought it up. But so it doesn't go without saying. It's now addressed, articulated clearly. And how they go about that is the, you know, between the Crown Castle and um, Robinsons and their lease of port, and that's not our business. Otherwise, the RF report was updated by the applicant to show that it still meets the RF. Um, exposure limits established by the FCC. And I believe that they also, um, the demands had requested additional information to radiation array and heat emissions. And this was offered as a courtesy 
by Crown Council is not required for a determination of compliance. So your commission, um, with regard to, you know, your planning commission options, you must take a separate action on each of these appeals. So you'll need to make a motion on the man appeal and make a decision, take an action, take a vote, and then do the same on the other appeal. So if your commission finds that 675 Rebecca Drive is the only location available that meets the coverage objectives, the facility may be considered compatible with the area and that the project proposed a camo proposes a camouflage facility design is located in the least visually intrusive location on site from the vantage point of the public view shed as required by the wireless regulation and employees camouflage design to the maximum extent feasible to minimize visual impacts to adjoining residential properties overall. So staff is recommending your commission uphold the approval of the zoning administrator with revision to the conditions of approval to reflect the revised project plans, now including landscaping to provide additional screening of views from both appellants property and that clarify the conditions of approval regarding decommissioning. So staff is recommending that references in the conditions of approval related to Helix environmental planning, that would be under the plan exhibits. They currently say the Helix plan dated January 14th. That's recommended to be revised to January 21st, and that's in your late correspondence. That's under exhibit D, and then under condition Roman numeral 2A9. Your packet proposes um, proposed revised findings are attached as 1C and the project plans are attached as 1E and with, with the revised uh, Helix plans dated January 21st, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission determine the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and that you approve application 201372 based on the revised findings or revised conditions of approval and as shown in the revised project plans, including the revised landscaping screening plan dated January 21st. And I wanna leave it open for consideration of a revised condition to address the man's concern about um, collaborative arborist prepared plans. So I'll leave that out there for consideration prior to your action, but staff's not recommending it at this time. And then secondly, regarding the Robinson appeal recommendation, Staff is recommending the Planning Commission determine the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approve application 201372 based on the revised findings and revised conditions of approval as shown on the revised project plans, including the revised landscaping screening plan dated January 21st, 2022. And that concludes my presentation, unless you have uh, further questions. Great, thank you so much. We appreciate that, Ms. McDaniel, and great presentation. And uh, thanks for addressing some comments and questions along the way. And did any other commissioners have questions of staff at this time? I have I have a couple of questions. Yes, Commissioner Lazenby, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I. Um, I'm a little confused. Is there a homeowners association on Rebecca Drive? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, so according to your presentation, the does the lot 675 actually have frontage on Rebecca Drive? Yes, it does. And that would be a parking lot for utility vehicles? It's not, there's a single parking space proposed for um, infrequent visits by wireless maintenance vehicles, typically a small truck. So there's an off street parking space proposed and then there'll be a walking path down the stairway to the facility for maintenance and repairs. Okay, and um, another question is, from the pictures, it looks as though there is a great deal of foliage between the proposed site and Rebecca Drive. Is that going to con 
be any kind of a problem for fire? Not, not, not that I'm aware of, no. They did not require any landscape clearing. In fact, the project is conditioned to require retention of the trees to provide protection of private um, um, views, visual impacts to private properties. So there's okay. no trees proposed to be removed as a part of this application. Okay, in the late correspondence, was there something that I, and I, I'm sorry, I, I've been trying to read all of it, but it seemed to me like there was something about the location of the staircase? Yes, the um, very early in the project review process, the plans showed a staircase located on the Robinson side of the property, which is to the, um, if you're looking in the slide photos, to the right or to the east of, the, of that tree um, next to the Robinsons. Um, but that was corrected to locate the stairway to the west side of the proposed platform next to the man's, closest to the man's property. Um, because there's a tree there and then at that fencing on the Robinson side. So that, so that was corrected um, in the project site plan. So your project packet, the actual architectural drawings show it on the west side. The site plan that includes the landscaping plan that's attached to your exhibit shows it on the Robinson side. So that was corrected in your slide and that's the reference to revision and the conditions of approval. So it's about consistency um, with the approved exhibit. So it's all, I think it's been cleaned up, tidied up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? All right, sounds good. So we can move on at this time. Um, Ms. Drake, I believe it's the time for the, the appellant to present. Hopefully we have Jocelyn here still. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, yes, Chair, we have two appellants. Um, so I will start with one and then we'll move on to the second one. They each have 10 minutes to make a presentation. Um, I'm seeing that Rob Mann, who's one of our appellants, is with us today. So I'll go ahead and start with Rob. Um, Rob, please restate your name for the record. You have 10 minutes. Good morning. Hello, Bob. can you hear me now? Yes, good morning. Great. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, uh, Ms. Drake and Sheila. Uh, my name is Rob Mann. Um, I'm the owner of 655 Rebecca Drive. And um, I've got 10 minutes, I'll try and keep it shorter than that. Uh, I want to cover a few things that Sheila raised through the presentation. Um, apologies for the late uh, addition for this letter. Um, my timing was I didn't receive the planning report until last Wednesday. I immediately noticed the error and in good faith raised that with uh, the county who quickly corrected it. So I only had three days to actually get an arborist report done. Um, a second point, yes, I was fully aware of the cell, cell tower going into uh, next door when I bought the property. Um, and just some additionals there. Um, I'm not asking for it to be invisible. I, I just want it to be reasonably screened um, and every feasible effort taken to minimize visual impact. And throughout this as well, I've been very happy working with the appellant and the county to try and come up with a reasonable plan. Um, I also want to engage with our arborists before this hearing, uh, but was told there wasn't time. And that was gave me concern that in the uh, zone administrator hearing, it was going to be collaboration, but I wasn't able to talk to the, the arborist firm in Helix. So a um, couple of other points. In the original application, um, there was no visual an analysis done from my property. It was one done from other properties, but not from 655. Uh, I did offer access um, to both the county and the applicant. The applicant did take me up on this about mid last year, I think it is. And he joined me on my deck and said to me that I wouldn't be able to see the cell tower, cell tower from my house. And um, under later conversations, he did say, wasn't quite sure exactly where it is, but it should be very minimal. Um, so on the back of that, as we got closer to the zone administrator hearing, 
I attempted to do a mock and it was a, it was an apron on a 12 foot pole. So it was not very good, but at least gave the approximate position of where the tower was going to be. I submitted those and on the back of the zone administrator hearing, the applicant uh, created a, a, an actual mock of within the correct location. And um, actually, uh, uh, to the county, I sent through a PDF of the five photos. Is it possible for you to present that? It should only take one minute or so. I don't know if, if you had if you had sent that, Rob, as a presentation, we would have loaded that, but I'm not sure if we're able to do that without having done so in advance. Got it. Okay. The actual photos are in the full deck from uh, full document. So I'll try and dig that up quickly in a minute, but it has all the photos from different rooms in my house and you can clearly see where the cell tower is. Um, so uh, that sort of leads into the, my comments on the landscaping plan. Um, before I get to that, I also wanted to shout out to the applicant who did a good job with the RF questions that I had. So he put me in touch with some uh, very experienced people and we spoke through some of those concerns and just wanna say thank you for, for giving, that, giving me that extra information. Um, okay, so onto the uh, proposal, uh, the report from applicant for Helix who are doing a landscaping plan. I got a second opinion on this and uh, there were a couple of issues identified in there. Um, for various reasons, the three sets of three species of tree that they proposed um, will have challenges in the location and the independent arborist suggested including redwood on that. So I'm asking here for an expansion of possible options on species there. Um, and ideally that uh, applicant and applicants, arborist and landscaping company work with me and my landscape and my harborist to come up with a mutually agreeable plan. And that was what was called for in the zone administrators um, review and further with, furthermore with an on-site review with the county and applicants through my property, um, uh, the county asked for the any plan to be sustainable. As in, we wanna make sure when we plant the trees, they stay planted and continue to grow and thrive over time. So the first up, just reassuring that applicant and their arborist work with me and my arborist come up with a reasonable and feasible plan for the long term there. Um, the second uh, comment uh, in the, the arborist report from the applicant, it called for three years of irrigation. It turns out it's gonna take longer than that. So I'm asking for applicant to commit to at least five years of tree care and irrigation on site or until the, uh, the WCF is adequately screened from the neighbors. Um, third up, uh, I'd like the applicant to commit to maintaining this screening for the lifetime of the actual installation or lifespan of the installation. And so if there's additional maintenance, um, damage or death of the, the plants, or just generally making sure that that stays in place and we continue that visual screen for the next 20 odd years. And the final thing I'd like to add is that I request the applicant starts executing on this planting plan as soon as viable so that we get ahead of some of the growth season here and reduce that period from five, at least five or six years to something uh, less. And um, I guess I'd like to close with two points. Five or six years is a pretty big impact on us. So it's uh, trees take a while to grow, even redwoods. And so we'll have this um, sitting outside for quite some time, which is not great. And uh, the second point I want to add is I had a chance to speak with applicants, a representative of the applicant, Tim Page, yesterday. And on the phone, he committed to being flexible in the tree planting program, adding more trees and shrubs as needed and installing whatever species we need to put in place to, uh, to make this viable. Okay, I think I covered all the things I wanted to cover. Any questions for me? Thank you so much for that. I believe that, um, Mr. H, should we do any questions of the appellants in particular or at the end? I think at the end would be good. Okay, great. Um, Chair, may I just make one comment? I would appreciate yes. if the uh, cell tower folks uh, respond to what he is suggesting he'd like to see, and then we'll know if they're in accord or not, or what we're gonna do next, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. I thought that was a clear explication of where you are, thank you. 
Thank you. And the um, uh, uh, Commissioner Shepard, the um, the project applicant will be provided time to speak, so maybe he can address both um, appellants' comments in one shot here after we hear from the next appellant. That would be my suggestion, Chair. That's what Great. I was, that's what I was, I agree. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I'll go ahead and move on to our second appellant um, who has 10 minutes as well. It looks like they are with us today. Um, Michael Tunink, um, good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have 10 minutes. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Tunick, and I represent appellant David Robinson. If the uh, moderator has the ability to activate my camera, that would be great. Okay, let's see, let me promote you. Um, let's see if we can, yeah. Let's see, can we, uh, can we, there we go. Do you please show Mr. Tunick? I'm not able to see him. We um, I can see him. Yeah, oh, you can. can as well. Okay, I'm sorry. I am just not able to. Okay. You can go ahead and resume. Uh all right. We Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Planning Commissioners. I appreciate your time here today. Um, just a moment. Excuse me, Mr. Tim, okay. interject for one quick second. Can we get the timer back up and started again before he continues? Thank you so much. Okay, please proceed, thank you. Planning Commissioners, thank you very much for your time here today. I will structure my comments in the same numerical order as Ms. McDaniel did in her staff report, which align with my appeal letter. The first issue is the inappropriateness of the Reddington's moving out of the neighborhood, but saddling this neighborhood with a wireless communication facility the neighborhood, including my client, does not want because the existing site uh, is subject to upgrade, and I'll get to in a moment to the reasons why it is subject to upgrade, despite the prior now resolved code compliance topics. But there is indeed a revenge motive by Miss by the Reddingtons in saddling the community and Mr. Robinson with this site. Uh, with regard to appeal issue number two, that Crown Castle has not exhausted other sites. Crown Castle contends and the county partially contends that the Robinson site is not sufficient for upgrade due to code compliance violations. That's actually no longer accurate. Uh, there was a compliance lawsuit filed by the county against Mr. Robinson. I represented Mr. Robinson in that, and on June 9, 2020, uh, a stipulation for settlement was filed that constituted a global resolution of all those code compliance issues. So that, uh, that settlement has been in place for more than a year and a half. Um, their Crown Castle talks about uh, illegal bed and breakfast issues building permit issues, and erosion control issues. First, on the bed and breakfast issues, my client's property is actually zoned for a bed and breakfast. The, the issues were not related to bed and breakfast, but rather uh, related to short-term rentals, Airbnb-type rentals. There have been no Airbnb short-term rentals on this property for nearly four years uh, since 2018, and that is established in the stipulation. Uh, when I refer to the settlement stipulation, I'm talking about uh, the 
technically the lawsuit number was 17 CV 01480. As I indicated, the stipulation was filed on June 9th. I worked very, very hard with code compliance supervisor, Matt Johnson of the planning department and with county council, Ryan Thompson to resolve all those issues. And they are resolved pursuant to the stipulation. The stipulation required a series of uh, permit application filings by Mr. Robinson, all of which have been properly met in a timely manner by Mr. Robinson. The first item related to building permit applications, the stipulation required that we file our permit applications over nearly a year and a half ago on October 15th, 2020. We filed those permit applications in a timely manner. The settlement stipulation said the county had 90 days to respond. We're now 15 months past that date, and we have not received any response from the county uh, to those applications. Now, I understand that county planning is challenged by applications related to the CZU fire and rebuilding. We are sympathetic to that, but the fact still remains that we filed those building permit applications over nearly a year and a half ago and have not received any response from the county. As to the erosion control code compliance issues, the stipulate the settlement stipulation at section 8B required that we file those erosion control uh, remediation applications on February 15, 2021. We did meet that timeline. That was slightly over 11 months ago. The stipulation required that the county respond to the to that application within 90 days we have not gotten any response. But bottom line, we have resolved the code compliance issues by stipulation. We're only waiting on the county to issue those permits so we can uh, remediate those topics. Certainly the county could, if it wanted to, grant a variance allowing upgrade of Mr. Robinson's existing wireless communication facility if it wanted to, considering the settlement framework is already in place. Second item under under the, the uh, allegation of inadequate uh, study into alternative sites was actually Mr. Reddington that sued Mr. Robinson. Mr. Reddington initiated that litigation in 2018. Mr. Robinson tendered the defense of that litigation to his insurer and the that attorney, that insurance appointed attorney, not Mr. Robinson, but the insurance appointed attorney did file a cross complaint against the uh, against Crown Castle to rectify some uh, slope stability issues that have been that Mr. Robinson and Crown Castle have been dealing with since 2011. Bottom line, this is an adequate site. We have resolved all of our issues to the best of our ability under that settlement stipulation. It's a little bit of a circular argument that Crown Castle makes in, hey, it, it, Robinson is not an adequate site. So Robinson's is an adequate site. Crown Castle then says, we don't want to be in contract with you or there's code compliance issues and therefore you're not a proper site. We, we are a proper site. We have resolved our code compliance issues to the best of our ability. And there has truly been no exploration of any sites other than the Robinson site or the, or the Reddington site. Um, the... In the drone photos, particularly item, I believe it was item two presented by Ms. McDaniel, it shows the proposed site as being far uphill. That's actually not accurate with, with current data. As if the planning commission were to review my memorandum submitted yesterday uh, in response to the helix, proposal dated or submitted the prior day this past Monday, January 24th, I attached photos exhibits one through eight to that supplemental memorandum that demonstrates the visual interference or the visual pollution, so to speak, is dramatic from the Robinson residents. And I would request that the planning commissioners uh, take a look at that. With regard to supplemental, uh, now I'm gonna move on to item three and I know my time is running. Um, as to supplemental condition of approval that was added at the zoning administrator meeting and after 
so condition of approval 3F and 3G, all the objections set forth in my appeal letter dated December 3rd, 2021 still remain. The amended conditions of approval do not adequately define decommissioning. Um, it, the new proposal talks about shutting off of power and, uh, and moving of equipment, but it still does not adequately address decommissioning or the verbal conditions of approval that were imposed at the, uh, at the zoning administrator hearing on November 19th. The criteria should relate to, well, the criteria that's proposed now relates to removal of equipment, shutting down of power, and removal of the existing WCF on Mr. Rob Robinson's property. Um, but it doesn't specifically identify what Ms. McDaniel verbally stated, which is restoration to original condition, which is requested. As to landscape screening, I refer the Planning Commission, please, back to my supplemental memorandum submitted yesterday in response to Helix's proposal of the day before. As for whether or not Mr. Robinson has made this an appellate issue, um, we have made it an appellate issue. And Crown Castle itself has made it an issue if the planning commissioners were to look at uh, pages 144 and 146 of the planning of, of, of the materials. Crown Castle has made the visual screening an issue here. The new report from Helix Environmental from this past Monday uh, proposes a single shrub on the Robinson side of the property. A single shrub will not adequately visually screen. With regard to, and I'm going to move quickly here, um, with regard to appellate issue item five, oh, I'll, I'll go back to item four just real quick and say that we request a collaborative plan with Crown Castle and ask that uh, that it that the permit not be uh, accepted until that's totally resolved rather than just putting it to a building permit stage. And finally, with regard to moving this proposed WCF downhill, um, it should be moved downhill. There is a, uh, the, the proposed one is 40 feet in elevation higher than the existing one on the Robinson property. And there's been no demonstration that, uh, that, that the coverage would not be adequate if it were moved downhill, similar to the current one. And I will just, uh, in closing, restate all my prior objections on my appellate issue items six, seven, and eight. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All Thank right. you. Do we have any questions of the appellants by the commission or comments that we could address right now? Well, I would like to find out the status of these code violations from the county since the attorney is suggesting that this is all resolved and that's not what we were told. So where are we? Um, we do have our... Um, code enforcement uh, manager on the line. I don't know if the commission would prefer to hear from the applicant first or hear from Matt Johnston with the county first. Doesn't really matter and that's up to the chair, but certainly it's a critical issue. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Oh, go ahead, Jocelyn. Thank you. I might suggest starting with um, the applicant and then moving on to Matt Johnston just to allow him some time to look into some of the, the comments that were made just now. We just brought him in. Thank you. That sounds good to me. Um, if any other commissioners had questions or comments now, let's hear those. Otherwise, we can go on to the applicant. Okay, so I do see we have the applicant with us today. Um, he has 10 minutes. It's Tim Page uh, representing Crown Castle. He has 10 minutes uh, per appeal. So we'll go ahead and uh, load 10 minutes and we'll see if he would like to save some time maybe for the end for rebuttal. We'll start with 10 and see where we get. Um, good morning, Tim. Will you please restate your name for the record? 
It looks like he. Good morning. My name is Tim Page with Crown Council. We'd like to defer this time right now to my colleague, Joe Parker, who will respond to the appellants. So if you could recognize Joe Parker, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's uh, him. And if you could restart the clock for Joe's time, that'd be great. Thank sure. you. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Gordon and members of the commission. Uh, is it possible to uh, promote uh, the video as well, please? I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I'm, I'm asking uh, for the video to uh, display to be uh, streamed. There we go. Uh, yep. There we go. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Joe Parker. By way of background, I've been representing Crown Council for 20 years. I regularly support applications of this type throughout the state of California. I've been personally involved with this project since its inception. And uh, I also have personal involvement with the code enforcement actions lodged against Mr. Robinson stemming from 2016 uh, when I became involved after Mr. Robinson uh, began blaming Crown Castle uh, for the code enforcement violations causing us to have to appear at the hearing and rebut those uh, contentions which were readily uh, rejected by the hearing officer. Um, to answer the commission's uh, initial question, we are agreeable with Mr. Mann's requested uh, uh, new conditions. Uh, as you can probably see, there's been a long history of cooperation between my client and Mr. Mann with respect to his concerns, and we're happy to address those. And as indicated by staff, uh, Crown Council's position is the same, and that is uh, we're happy to choose any species of trees uh, that are appropriate and selected by his arborist. And we believe that the zoning administrator's um, condition of approval with regard to that is appropriate. And to the extent the commission wants to add additional uh, conditions um, uh, to that to meet his latest requests, uh, we are in agreement with that. And Mr. Page did have a conversation with Mr. Mann and, and confirmed that uh, I believe as late as yesterday. Um, with respect to uh, Mr. Robinson's appeal, uh, I note that in his appeal, he made comments about a late submission of this landscape plan. I just want to point out that that's not accurate. The, the zoning administrator's uh, condition was that we provide that prior to submission for a building permit. Uh, we did that early uh, uh, in an effort to be prepared here uh, for this appeal and so that the planning commission would have the benefit of our arborist plan. Uh, there was an issue with uh, the original drawing not showing the stairs on the correct side and, and that was corrected, but the, the plan remains the same. Uh, and of course, we're happy to modify that as requested by Mr. Mann. Um, present with me is Tim Page. He's the program manager and has primary responsibility for the project. Also, Jacob uh, Sparks, also from Crown Castle. He's project manager. We also have Raj uh, Mathur here from Hammett and Edison, uh, and he is an RF engineer. So to the extent the commission has any questions about the uh, propagation maps, we're happy to address those. And lastly, uh, Gordon Murray from Applied Imagination and Prepared the Photosims is also present to the extent the commission may have some questions about that. Um, I I'll just note very quickly, we have a long history of code enforcement issues with Mr. Robinson. Uh, you know, there's essentially five factors that have caused us to uh, relocate this facility. The, the code violations, obviously, which start back as early as 1999 and involve my client uh, commencing uh, in approximately 2015. Uh, Mr. Robinson has blocked access to the facility, which has inhibited our ability to maintain and repair the facility. Uh, that's a critical feature uh, for maintaining and sustaining coverage. Uh, as, this, as staff notes, uh, we have the inability to pull building permits, and that has caused uh, significant uh, interruptions uh, with upgrade of the network on behalf of AT&T as well as T-Mobile. Um, we have expiring leases as well. Uh, as I noted in my letter to you of January 14th, I'm not going to go through and repeat and reallege everything that's in that uh, submission to you, but I will hit the highlights. 
And of course, lastly, there's litigation involving my client and Mr. Robinson. Uh, the Reddingtons did file a lawsuit in response to property damage, which they allege is the result of Mr. Robinson's illegal activities. And similar to his efforts back in 2016, uh, they are now trying to blame that again on Crown Castle, which is not a meritorious contention. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are literally five reasons why we have chosen not to remain in contract uh, and uh, we'll let those leases expire. Uh, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Tunick's client, uh, he's somewhat of a moving target uh, with respect to his objections to this project, all of which I suspect are aimed at his efforts to retain the income that is being paid uh, by my client in the form of rent. I will point out that in the spirit of cooperation, my client has always paid the rent and continues to pay the rent to Mr. Robinson, uh, notwithstanding his material breach of the lease and other problems uh, that we've encountered. Uh, with respect to landscaping issues, uh, I will point out that as noted by staff, this objection uh, to screening was not the topic of discussion at the zoning hearing. Uh, it was largely focused on Mr. Mann's uh, concerns, which we addressed there. Uh, notwithstanding that, um, we have called for the installation of a shrub, as you can see from the landscape plan. If uh, the planning commission feels that additional vegetative screening is necessary, we're happy to accommodate that uh, request similar to Mr. Mann. I simply ask that whatever the condition is that we modify similar to what the zoning administrator issued for Mr. Mann be issued for Mr. Robinson as well. Uh, we, we did set it up, as you note, uh, with communications being uh, through the primary uh, channel who is staff in this situation. Uh, as you can tell, there's a, a long history of cooperation with us and Mr. Mann. Some of that will be limited, obviously, with Mr. Robinson because council needs to communicate rather than the parties given the litigation uh, and therefore channeling these requests through staff makes the most sense. Um, with regard to uh, the existing facility, I'll just point out that the lease itself has uh, removal conditions in it, essentially requires us to remove the facility, restore it to its original condition, ordinary wear and tear accepted. That's standard con condition in most telecom leases. Uh, I also believe that the commission's uh, or the plant zoning administrator's condition regarding removal of the facility following full commissioning of the new facility is appropriate. I don't think there's any issue. With that, uh, we simply uh, need to maintain on-air service until the new facility is completed, and then you do a seamless cutover, and uh, the purpose there being is not to interrupt coverage. Um, I will note that this uh, coverage that's provided by this facility for both T-Mobile and AT&T, as you note from the propagation map, is substantial, and um, the installation will, uh, of the new facility will substantially improve coverage and bring uh, modifications to the network, which we've been trying to do for the last seven years. It also includes the installation of FirstNet, which is a uh, network that is entirely dedicated uh, to the use uh, by first responders, which obviously is an important factor in your community. Um, the landscape uh, conditions uh, we've covered, uh, you've seen that my client has been cooperative with regard to the heat maps and to that provided to Mr. Mann, um, and I believe he's satisfied by that. Uh, in general, we meet uh, the requirements of the conditions of the code uh, with respect to aesthetics. Um, you know, that's covered by 13.10.661 and 0 .663. Uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Uh, Tunick's comments about alternative site analysis, I'll just note as confirmed by staff's report, there were more than 50 sites that were analyzed by my client, frankly, in 20 years of doing this type of work, uh, that is the most extensive alternative site analysis that I've seen. And you will see from the coverage maps in your packet uh, that this indeed is the location that will replace uh, the coverage that will be lost when the site is decommissioned. And many of the other locations are simply infeasible to provide that coverage. And so with respect to not only the county's code, uh, but also the federal standards, we believe we've met the substantial gap in coverage analysis that is laid out by the various cases cited in my January 14 letter. Um, I, um, I'll try to move quickly here, um, understanding that I'm addressing both appeals. Uh, Chair Gordon, may I have additional time because my assumption here is that I have 10 minutes per appeal. Absolutely. And I'll try to wrap it up here very quickly. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, when thank you. Is, when we get down to zero, if we could just add another 10 minutes on to the timer, I'd appreciate it. Yes, and, I, and I'll be uh, sure not to take up the, the second half of the 10 minutes in its entirety. Um, uh, moving on here, you know, notwithstanding uh, the representations by council uh, about settlement uh, with the county uh, with respect to these ongoing code violations, again, I'm just going to point out we've had uh, more than seven years of conflict, uh, which has uh, substantially impacted our ability to operate this facility. And frankly, given the time, expense, uh, and cost, uh, associated uh, with moving the facility, you can be assured that uh, we're at the end of our rope if we're uh, choosing to do that. I will point out uh, that obviously this new facility is being built in accordance with the county's current standards. It's at a lower elevation, it meets the height requirements, and frankly, uh, with that in mind, I think that uh, the facility as proposed uh, provides much less of an impact than the existing facility. I do find it curious that uh, Mr. Robinson uh, has allowed uh, the communication facility that we erected on his property to exist without any complaints with respect to aesthetics, but now we have uh, complaints from him, late complaints with him with respect to aesthetics, uh, and that includes his own removal of the fence that we were talking about. Uh, but in, uh, in reality, if, if that is truly an issue rather than a transparent attempt to retain uh, the rents, uh, as I've noted before, we're, we're happy to submit uh, and agree to the same conditions uh, that uh, were asked of uh, by us by the zoning administrator with respect to Mr. Mann's uh, issues. Um, simply no problem with that. And I think that the screening uh, capabilities of vegetation are, are easily met in this circumstance. So if the commission feels that additional shrubs or trees are necessary, we're happy to accommodate that. I do ask though that it just be in the same form of uh, the uh, current condition, and that is to allow us to obtain our approval at this uh, stage and to simply comply with the conditions of approval, which in my experience has been a standard condition that you routinely see from planning commission. Um, this particular facility is subject to the shot clock doctrine under federal law. Uh, so continuing the hearing uh, past uh, another 31 days uh, does create some issues. And again, uh, that can be resolved quite easily here by uh, simply imposing the same condition uh, that is imposed with Mr. Mr. Mann as to landscaping to Mr. Robinson to the extent that you feel that is appropriate. Um, lastly, uh, I'll just point out uh, that uh, with respect to the substantial gap analysis, uh, you can see from the coverage maps, and Mr. Uh, Mather can address those questions so that the commission has that, uh, that you know, we indeed have made substantial effort to make sure that the coverage that's being provided to the community will be the same and frankly will be better. Uh, that's not only a benefit to the customers here, but to the community at large. Uh, as the commission may be aware, these facilities provide both 911 and E911 services, which apply not only to subscribers, but members of the general public and first responders. And of course, the added benefit of FirstNet, which is the network for first responders, is uh, indeed a substantial benefit in this community. Um, I also will note that our efforts here are aimed at building this facility as quickly as possible. Uh, in light of the, the impending fire season, uh, you know, wireless communication facilities are indeed greatly relied upon by first responders uh, in times of natural disaster. And, and obviously this is uh, a, a risk area and one that we're concerned about. Uh, secondly, our client has been on hold, uh, meaning AT&T and T-Mobile and AT&T in particular for the better part of seven years, not being able to upgrade the network. And as I mentioned in my letter, uh, when you do nationwide upgrades, uh, if a facility cannot be upgraded, it affects the network as a whole. So it is a significant issue for us. Um, lastly, uh, I just point to the fact that there's been a substantial amount of cooperation by my client. Uh, as you can tell, this staff's report is 233 pages long. Uh, we understood going into this that we would be asked to vet this project uh, from a 360 degree view that includes anything from soil and engineering analysis to RF analysis, alternative site analysis, and of course, aesthetics. I think uh, in light of the record that's before you and the cooperation that's been extended by my client, uh, we have indeed met all of the conditions required by your code and uh, uh, additionally extended cooperation beyond 
what is required, uh, certainly to the satisfaction of Mr. Mann, as you've heard. Uh, at the earlier hearing, uh, we did not uh, receive substantial objection from other neighbors. In fact, we did receive support. I do understand uh, that uh, public officials from the fire department and possibly the sheriff's department also support this project, and you may hear from someone in support of that today. Uh, and again, if the commission has any questions about any specifics of the project, if I can't answer it, the members of the team from Crown Castle are here to answer those questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. I appreciate that. Very thorough response. Thank you so much. And um, Mm -hmm. Drake, at this point, I guess we can have some, actually, let me back up one quick second. I apologize. Tim Page has his hand raised, and they do have a little time left. So, Tim, did you have more to say? or Just, just, really, just really to buttress Joe Parker's point, on page eight of the current staff report, at the bottom of the page, it has the recommended conditions of approval as Exhibit 1C. And we, we fully intend to comply with uh, the first revision. And it says provide additional landscape screening to both east and west of the proposed WCS. And so that would cover uh, both applicants' concerns. And then lastly, we would like to hear from code enforcement in a response to the questions from planning commissioners. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Drake, maybe we, if code enforcement is ready, that would be probably appropriate time before we move on to further public comment. Sure. All right. We have Matt Johnston joining us this morning with the county's uh, code enforcement division. Good morning, Matt. Unmute. There we go. Good morning. Uh, I can lower my hand there. And uh, is my camera on? I don't see it, but I can speak regardless. Um, we had a stipulation. Um, join as a panelist. Uh -huh. Sorry, I promoted him to panelist so he could speak freely. <clears throat> Matt. Unmute. There we go. Okay. Um, nice to you. <laughs> good to see you all. Hello, commissioners uh, and members of the public. Um, we do have a um, stipulation that was worked out over the course of uh, quite a while with Mr. Robinson, his attorney. Um, in that stipulation, um, section 6B requires that uh, the defendant submit all required applications and fees by October 15th, 2020. And this is specific to the, um, the dirt patio and the concrete. It's a grading and, and um, retaining walls associated with the dirt patio and concrete work. Um, the applications uh, for both of those were, were late. Uh, the application for the, um, oh, let me pull it up for just a moment. Give me just a moment. Da, da. The application for the retaining wall uh, was submitted uh, on March 3rd, 2021 uh, for the grading permit was just 10 days late on the 25th of November, 2020. Uh, in the stipulation, there was uh, acknowledgement that there would be uh, likely a deficiency letter. Um, it's common with applications that it doesn't have all the information necessary. Um, and it, the stipulation specifically gives 90 days from the issuance of that um, completeness letter or incomplete letter, however you want to term it, uh, in which to respond to the deficiencies. Uh, no submittal has been, so within 30 days of both of those submittals, uh, the county um, sent Mr. Robinson the deficiency letters. Uh, to date, we've had no response to those, no resubmittal. So both the initial submittals were after the agreed upon date and the 90 day uh, response was, uh, has not been adhered to. So that's where we are out of compliance. Thank you so much. Did anyone, any other commissioners have questions for Mr. Johnson? 
Uh, I had a question. So starting at the very beginning, in my understanding, a stipulation is a legal term for a settlement agreement. If all the conditions of it are met, then you're done and things are resolved. Yes. So with the uh, common common to our code enforcement practices, uh, when we can reach an agreement with a property owner who's in violation, it sets out the terms under which they will comply. Um, there typically are penalties associated with that. County Council is currently looking at the uh, the stipulation, um, I believe, as we speak, because it's come come to light with this hearing. Uh, that uh, and so there will be actions by County Council to um, enforce the stipulation moving forward. So what you're saying is, the necessary submissions and fees that were part of the stipulation were either are have they been they were submitted, but beyond the date that were in the stipulation for their submission. And the county has notified Mr. Robinson and his attorney that these were not received within the agreed upon times. I mean, we're, I'm a little confused as to exactly where we are. So no, the, the stipulation spells out when the submittals should have been done mm -hmm. and, and then recognizes that any corrections should be done within 90 days of receiving that correction letter. The correction letters went out as part of the normal permitting process. Um, so that triggered a 90 day uh, responsibility to correct those corrections. Um, that has not been done. There hasn't been any formal communication between code compliance and Mr. Robinson and his attorney on that measure. That is, is still out of compliance and it's one of the, the many items in code compliance that we need to get to, to um, bring people into compliance. So um, normally, if someone has to correct something, they correct it, notify the county and say, this is done. And you say, fine, we'll come out, inspect it and sign it off. And that's what's not happening. Yeah, the correction in this case, I believe uh, one of the corrections was for uh, the soils report um, that was not associated with the grading or re the retaining walls, which are six, eight, six to eight feet tall. Um, and let me actually, I can pull up the grading uh reviews um and please attach the soils report with the next routing and address the soils report review comments from the building permit previous building permit which are also attached um so this uh, without a, an approved soils report we can't approve the, the grading or the retaining wall and what about the status of bed and breakfast being legal or not legal do you care to comment on that uh, it, the the uh, stipulation agrees there will be no advertising for any short-term rentals. There will be no use of the facility as a short-term rental. So short-term rentals, that was uh, uh, the heart of a lot of the code case. There was the house had uh, been remodeled and recontoured outside and advertised as a, an event center. Um, that stopped prior to our signing of the, the stipulation. Um, so as far as we're concerned, we, we do not have a case, active code case regarding a vacation rental on the property. Um, of course, if we come across any advertising for that use, that would be a violation of the stipulation. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Maybe other commissioners do as well. Is our, is our, so right now you're saying that this is going to be referred to the county council? Yes, actually, during the meeting, I, I got an email from County Council seeking an update. So I assume he is listening in as well. Um, and, and this will be moving forward to enforce the stipulation as it's written. All right. Thank you. I guess I have one question um, just from something that I think the attorney brought up um, that he said in passing, but I just wanted to clarify. He said that the property was zoned for the bed and breakfast, but that would mean that the property is zoned visitors serving. And I don't think that that is the case, but maybe I'm incorrect. Uh, the property is zoned uh, residential agriculture, RA. Um, and I believe that RA can allow for a bed and breakfast on it with a permit for a bed and breakfast, but no such permit exists. With permit, right. right. Okay, thank you, Matt. Appreciate the explanations. I see um, Commissioner Lazenby has her hand raised, Chair. 
Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Lazenby. Thank you. The um, is the ultimate result of all of this that these code compliance violations are still open. Portions of them, yes. So there were there were various complaints um, throughout the last several several years or decade or so. Um, I believe the um, cases go back into uh, the late nineties. Uh, for remodels, for recontouring, building retaining walls, um, as well as for the use. Currently, um, the outstanding uh, uh, violations are for the grading uh, and the retaining wall, um, as well as the, uh, uh, I believe the upper deck has not been um, fully approved. Um, some of the, the remodel, exterior remodels. Um, the grading was of specific concern uh, with the re-contouring re, re, uh, of the driveway. It was cut down and the drainage uh, has created a destabilized uh, edge of the access road that goes around the bottom of the property and to the, uh, the cell tower and beyond. Um, so the, that is something that we, we put a high priority on resolving to ensure that if vehicles are gonna drive along that area that they are, um, safe uh, and without under, understanding that there is a lawsuit that includes the utilities to resolve the issues around that, uh, it's difficult for us to um, require that to be immediately addressed. Uh, so that right now the exist that is also an existing, there are two different grading issues. One is the grading associated with creating the large uh, raised patio. The other is the, uh, the drainage and the, the stabilization of the hillside along that edge. Um, both of those are outstanding. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I had one. I was just hoping that staff could read again or just clarify what the additional condition on the agreement of, you know, the new landscaping plan. It seems like that was you know, an amenable change, but I, I didn't quite understand, or, you know, I didn't quite catch it all. I really just want to understand whether or not it, you know, is worded in a way that could cause any future challenges between the applicant and the appellants, or if it's something that can, you know, we're making sure it's going to be streamlined fairly easily. Um, Sheila can address that. Okay, to answer your question, I had proposed that that be deferred until um, it was taken back to your commission, but I do have a condition that's drafted um, to address it. I um, have found in the past that unless you have a contract for actual maintenance by uh, you know, arborist or landscape professional, that becomes contentious and puts staff in a position of trying to play referee. So what I did is prepared language in indicating the following, and I'll read it a couple times, and I'll read it slowly so everybody's following along. The language it's proposed is going to replace language under Roman numeral 2A9 in the conditions of approval. And the language is proposed to read, the applicant shall submit a final landscape and irrigation plan, comma, coordinated between the applicant's arborist, comma, the man's arborist, comma, the Robinson's arborist, consisting of landscape screening along the west side of the facility and the east side of the facility, period. Final plan shall include a mutually agreeable planting plan, including tree and shrub species selection, comma, number, comma, location, comma, spacing, comma, size, comma, and a managed tree care program, in parentheses, a minimum of five years, comma, or until the trees and or shrubs fully screen the facility, and that includes a contract for landscape management, period, in parentheses, period. Final landscaping irrigation plan shall be reviewed and approved by planning staff. Um, a second condition revision I'm proposing is condition uh, Roman numeral 4B, which require currently requires retention of all existing trees. I'm going to revise, propose that it be revised to 
retention of all existing and proposed trees so that once those are in, in place, they're protected in perpetuity. That does be, tend to be a problem. It was a problem in the fire where the trees were removed and there was no such condition requiring trees to be on site after the fire, so which presented a problem for the neighbors. So in anticipation, I've added those two changes. Um, and that's, I can read it again if folks would like, or I could suggest your commission enacting, taking a motion on the project that you um, adopt staff's language with um, that language on consent for final adoption at your next meeting uh, or as desired. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, unless another commissioner would like it read it again right now, I, I think that we could address that again later as we get to the motion. So um, I appreciate that clarification. Any other commissioners, anything else to add? We could do that now, otherwise um, move on to the public comment. Uh, just so I'm clear um, there, Sheila, you have two uh, revised or new conditions that you've just made us acquainted for. So in a motion, how would you title them? That one is about the uh, about the tree selection and planting. Yeah, one is um, one is about vision. retention of existing and proposed trees. Yes, that's okay. true. So there's the um, existing uh, required final landscape and irrigation plan under Roman numeral two A nine. The existing condition is proposed to be stricken and replaced with the language I um, just noted. And then um, operational condition, Roman numeral 4B would include um, retention of proposed trees besides the existing. So the language would add proposed to that. I mean, I can, I can finalize the, um, if you want some, that's something a little more articulated, I could do that, but if that's not clear. So your well, motion would be- act Basically, so you're, you're saying we would want to mention the revised conditions for Roman numeral 2A9 and Roman numeral 4B. Yes. Okay. As staff recommended. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, do we have any other members of the public that would like to speak on the matter? Um, yes, um, I am, am seeing some hands raised. Um, so we'll go to the public here. And this is the opportunity that folks have if they wish to make a comment on this proposed appeal. Um, at 675 Rebecca, I see a couple of hands raised. We'll go ahead and start with uh, Fire Chief Mark Bingham. Good morning, Mr. Bingham. You have three minutes. Everybody has three minutes, including you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, good morning. Good morning. If you want to open my video or not, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I just wanted to speak to the group today um, in regards to the importance of the cell coverage. Uh, communications are critical for emergency ag agencies uh, to get public safety announcements out. Uh, like, for instance, the evacuation notice that came out in uh, 2020 in August. Um, cellular, connect, cellular connectivity also helps us uh, make general and operational decisions, um, like directing some of our resources and getting critical uh, time sensitive communications back from the field um, so we can redirect those resources. Um, that came into play during the CZU fire uh, again of August 2020 uh, and was very crucial when our radio towers uh, started to fail us. Uh, we had to transition over to cell and then back to radio as, as we could. Um, so the coverage is important to me to ensure the safety of our first responders and the firefighters of um, Boulder Creek Fire Protection District, which also uncovers uh, When our radio infrastructure went down uh, during that fire, we leaned heavily along uh, onto that cellular network. And uh, during that time period, I personally had to drive up Fairmount to uh, Nina, to Rebecca, to get to that cul-de-sac to get as close as I could to the remaining cellular that we did have. Uh, in order to make the necessary communications back out to the, the rest of the world that wasn't being so uh, impacted as we were. Uh, that's all I have to say. I just really want you guys to consider the importance and the need for cellular uh, up on that mountain in the report. Thank you. 
thank you. I will move on to David Robinson. Good morning, David. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Yeah, my name is David Robinson. Thank you, uh, members of the commission. Can you turn my camera on? Um, I can. I would need. Um, I can. I would need to promote you just a moment. To promote you just a moment. Join us. Okay. All right, you should be a panelist now so we can see you. Let's see. Hmm. Hello? Uh oh. His connection sounded a little bit weak earlier. Good morning. Are you are you still with us? You, unmute. Okay, there's are the you unmute. Still with us? Yeah, I'm with you. They just had to unmute uh, the video. There we go. Okay. All right, you have three minutes. Good morning. All right, you have three I, minutes. Good okay. morning. I, I think this photo from my deck really tells a great deal about what's going on here. This uh, facility is right up against my property line as close as it possibly can be. And it's like having a giant billboard out there. And these facilities mm -hmm. at night, you know, they're lit up when they're working on them. And Crown Castle is saying, oh, they rarely come to the property. They're, they're to my property almost every day. Uh, Crown Castle is saying that I've denied them access. I've never denied them access. And uh, right now I have two generators that are on my property and they come every week to maintain those generators as well. <clears throat> uh, talking about this deficiency level letter, I nor my attorney have received any communication of a deficiency letter uh, since submitting the permit applications to the county. Uh, you know, I do not want Crown Castle on my property. I want them to leave. There have been horrible tenants. Uh, Crown Castle is saying that I'm fighting to keep them on the property because I want their rent. I don't want their rent. I don't want them on there at all. Uh, AT&T in, in 2014 uh, did an erosion report. Uh, in 2011, did an erosion report that said that all of these deficiencies need to be taken care of around the cell sites and around uh, their underground conduits that were eroding. The underground conduits were right now stick out of the side of my hill and they were under eight feet of soil and the erosion has never been taken care of. Uh, this facility uh, will be on the on next to my property for the next 60 years. The current facility on my property has been here for 28 years. Uh, we should be able to take the time now to get this design correct, get that facility moved down the hill, moved over to the center of the property. You know, Crown Castle is an $85 billion company, and I'm a realist. I know that my neighbors and myself cannot win against an $85 billion company. This is the way it is these days. Whatever an eighty-five billion dollar company wants, they will get. In two thousand eighteen, AT&T re reimbursed me thirty-one thousand dollars for the money I had spent on cell site erosion control work. Thus, they're admitting that they understand that there's work that they're responsible for. After reimbursing me, AT&T took over the erosion project with their contractor, contracted engineer. DES builders and committed to correct the erosion repairs called for in the uh, uh, 2011 geotechnical engineering report that they paid for. And uh, they, they started doing all the work, including additional uh, 
surveys and soils reports until Crown Castle told them to stop. Okay, Dave, you're at three minutes. Thank you. Dave, you're at three minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go back to the list. All right, I'll go back to the list. And um, um, Straight, can we ask CTV to mute the people that are not speaking? And if you. That would be great. Page, that would be great. Some, getting some feedback for Troy Hardwick. I am, I am as well. Thank you. Um, all right. So let me see if we have any additional members of the public who wish to speak at this time. Again, you would press star nine on your telephone if you would like to make yourself known and remotely raise your hand. And I am not seeing any at this time, Chair. I am seeing that Joe Parker um, uh, is raising his hand. He is with the um, appellant team, and they did have five minutes left, so I don't know if you wanted to circle back with him for final comments. Well, if you, he's on the applicant team, and they get... Oh, that's right. Sorry, applicant team. Thank you. Okay, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes, um, Mr. Parker, did you have any further comments? Uh, just briefly, uh, Chair Gordon, uh, you know, frankly, uh, the county's been dealing with Mr. Robinson and his illegal activities since 1999. You know, it's more than 20 years. My client has been dealing with him for the better part of seven years. Uh, we are still dealing with problems with compliance. Uh, enough is enough at this stage. Uh, this is a private civil dispute between my client and Mr. Robinson, mostly directed by his action uh, and our defense of claims, which we believe have no merit. Uh, and so, you know, his efforts to push us uh, to remain on his property are, are, are not an appropriate condition uh, for consideration here. With respect to his comments about erosion, all of those erosion issues have been caused by his illegal construction activities. The cell carrier's contribution to those amounts, it's very typical in our industry to contribute amounts to landlords, uh, even in situations where we have not been the cause of those problems, simply to move our operations and need to manage and maintain uh, these facilities forward in an effort to provide the coverage uh, that is you know, needed in these areas, as pointed out by the battalion chief. Uh, with respect to the landscape condition, uh, I, I just want to point out to the commission that the current landscape condition before you uh, does include screening not only to the east, but to the west of the property, which includes Mr. Robinson's property. I, I think that uh, you already have an arborist from Crown Castle. You have Mr. Mann's arborist. Uh, you've already heard uh, that uh, staff is agreeable with the arborist hired by Mr. Mann's. Uh, selection of species, we have no objection to that. I don't see why a third arborist or further communication is really necessary if this is already a condition to simply continue the screening onto the locations uh, on the side uh, that has been uh, raised by Mr. Robinson as being a problem. So given uh, his long history of uh, interference and non-compliance, it, it doesn't make, and the fact that he's in litigation with my client, you know, having a dialogue with him rather than just speaking through staff uh, and to arborists uh, seems to me to be unnecessary and probably a means uh, within which to slow this project down, which obviously we do not have any intention of wanting to do in this situation. So I would simply ask that the commission take that into consideration, but you do have my client's full cooperation to uh, plant additional uh, screening if the commission feels that's necessary as well as uh, undertake the uh, extended conditions that have been requested by Mr. Mann, which we find entirely to be reasonable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And everyone's comments today. Um, this time we'll close the public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Would any commissioners like to start off? Well, this is a complicated one, but um, just I, I am uh, satisfied uh, that I am ready to make a motion just to start the ball rolling here. Um, 
since there has to be two motions uh, to um, um, just looking at the language so I get it right. Um, that we determine the project is exempt from further environmental review under the Environmental Quality Act and approve the application 201372 based on the revised findings and revised conditions of approval as shown on the revised project plans, along with the added conditions or revised conditions to uh, Roman numeral 2A9 and Roman numeral 4B as proposed by staff. And I would like to make the same application, the same motion as regards to the Robinson approval and with the same language. Is that, are we, is that a motion on the, I think we should start with the man appeal to start with and then move on from there. And Commissioner Shepard, yes. are you making a motion on the man? Yes. Appeal? Thank you. We have a second on the motion. I will second that. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Do you have any other further discussion prior to a vote? Um, I guess, you know, I'm willing to support the motion um, to support my colleague and it's in her district. Um, I see this as actually uh, pretty straightforward. We are very narrow in the scope of what we consider on these wireless applications. And that's basically boiled down to uh, visual impacts. I felt that the uh, original application to the zoning administrator with the changes that were made by the zoning administrator were more than sufficient in order to meet our requirements in the code. Um, I So I, I am less, I didn't second the motion because I wasn't really um, convinced that we needed the uh, change to condition, the first condition nine. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit wary about um, uh, putting the applicant in that kind of a position um, when I felt that the original application had met our code requirements sufficiently. Uh, so that's where I am. I thought that the conditions laid out by the appellant man were reasonable. Um, the other, the other conditions, um, I thought, went a little bit more than what our code would require. Well, I, I just want to add, I'm I'm suggesting we approve those changes simply because the applicant has agreed that. They're amenable to him, so I'm willing to go with them. I could clarify really quickly as we're talking about the man appeal only right now. Is the condition going to be the same on both? So that, in particular, the need to have the arborists communicate will be imposed on the man appeal right now, and then that will be separately considered for the. Um, Robinson appeal, is that correct? I'd like to ask staff what they suggest. Sheila, do you want to address that or shall I? Yeah, I think that's a very, a point well taken. Um, perhaps for the man, the condition should be revised to say that uh, coordinated between the applicant's arborist and the man's arborist, excluding the Robinson arborist, in the condition of approval revision so that only um, on the man side, it'd be required to be coordinated between the man property owners, arborist, and then on the east side, the same would be said for the Robinsons that the applicants arborist coordinate with the Robinsons arborists on that side. That way we're not um, holding up. But I, you know, it's probably easier that way than we have three arborists. I agree with the um, attorney for, um, well, in that castle, um, but in that case, I I would like to amend my motion to reflect what staff has just suggested. So each motion will be revised to reflect the so the man's motion is revised to reflect coordination between the man's arborist and the applicant's arborist, and the motion for Robinson would 
be revised to reflect the coordination between the arborist for both parties. Is that clear? So you're still on the rock man motion then? We are. Okay. Do we, so we uh, have amended the motion. Do we second the amendment to the motion? I'm sorry, can I just, can I just be your house to approve it? Yeah. Sorry, I cut out a little bit there. Can you say that again? Uh, Judith, I think you seconded the motion. Aren't you agree to this change? I, I did, and I would um, I would second the amended motion if it provides, and this is a friendly amendment, if it provides for written documentation or agreement between each one of these particular parties. Something memorialized in writing. So what staff usually does in this these situations is that I defer to the applicant to coordinate with their respective parties. And then I have them submit the agreement with both emails from respective parties agreeing to that submitted document. And then it's written, it's in written fashion that yes, we've accepted what's being submitted and both parties in agreement. And that's the best way to do it. And then I don't have to get in the middle of navigating this process for them. They just submit it, agreed upon plan, and they can do it as a combined email or separate emails, but I get a written confirmation in the system. Okay, that would work. I appreciate that. So I will second the motion as amended. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Do we have any other comments or clarity needed before we move on to a vote on the man appeal? Can I just ask for clarification from Ms. McDaniel? I, I understand what we're going to vote on here, but I'm hoping for clarification and what it is we're going to vote on next. And I know it's an odd thing to ask for, but I'm, are you suggesting that we, when we go on to the second one, that we have different language in the conditions of approval so that in the next one that we have requirement that they still coordinate with the Robinsons and their arborists yeah, versus yeah. in this one. So you, you're, so it would, I guess my, the reason I'm asking is that if we're concerned that the coordination with the arborist is going to cause delays of the project, I'm just curious how voting, still having that condition of approval in um, the, the present that they coordinate with the Robinsons, how that will, how that could, how not having it present here but having it still present would not well, cause so, delays. So I'm hoping maybe you can speak to that. I guess, I mean, I think confused. your point is well taken because it will be challenging for the applicant to coordinate with, on one hand, their arborist and the man's arborist separately for agreement on that side of the facility, and then to coordinate with the Robinson arborist on the other side of the facility. Um, the plan can be prepared by one arborist, but the agreement would be to the selected species on each side. I mean, maybe that would be another way to another tack here to approach that it will be difficult, you know, get normally we don't, we don't require everybody and their brother to agree to a plans. Um, but I thought that everyone was in agreement here. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of a, a little bit at a loss to it to, to explain it quite frankly, because this is very unusual um, language, but um, I'm so open to suggestions. I'm really glad that Commissioner Violanti brought that up because that's my main concern as well. I mean, I think this is critical yeah. infrastructure and that that is when we have these wireless applications, we sometimes that always gets lost. And especially mm -hmm. up in this area, you know, I understand we want to do everything we can to screen this infrastructure um, for the neighbors, um, so it's not to create visual impacts, but we do not want to add a condition in here that is going to allow um, this infrastructure to, um, to 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 not be operational. Mm -hmm. So that's my main concern, and, and if that, I mean, I kind of hear uh, Sheila articulating that that could happen, and if that's the case, I can't support this motion. So one thing that just occurred to me is that you could revise that language to require a third party arborist, not hired by anybody. And then the agreement is the applicant 
and Mans and the Robinsons agree to the screening and all the detail on it. And then that way it's a single arborist prepared plan for that. And um, if they don't though, then what? So what do we usually so, do? Don't we usually just agree that there's going to be a trees planted, they're going to be maintained, and there it is. Like, was, I yeah, feel like that, that's what I was comfortable with, you know, with the original kind of proposal, like including the suggestion by Mr. Mann. I thought his, you know, what he asked for was reasonable. Um, but so I guess going more than that, um, I just don't want to set us up to not be able to have this critical piece of infrastructure be operational. Yeah, I share um, Commissioner Dan's concerns that we may be adding something, especially since I felt comfortable with the idea that it sounds like the applicant and Mr. Mann have had a so far positive relationship in terms of addressing his concerns and they're willing to have continuing conversations. And I almost worry that we're adding a condition that may not be necessary, given that they're both amenable to having these conversations, that it's possible we could simply pass the staff's original recommended um, uh, language with the revised landscape plans dated January 21st, but with the understanding it may not even need to be a condition that Mr. Mann and Town Council will continue to have conversations about which species it is. It doesn't need to be a condition, given that they're both amenable. Uh, I understand that it would maybe more codified if we put it in specifically their arborists continue to have conversation. But I agree with Commissioner Dan that I don't want to prevent this project from moving forward, especially given that we are meeting our objectives and our direction as a commission by, by approving this given um, what I think the ZA did and then some of the additional language that got put in here about more specific language around the decommissioning of, of the current one and, and things of that nature. Um, so I, I worry we're adding an extra burden where it may not be necessary, and especially a, a delay if, if we require um, coordination with parties that aren't ha so far haven't had uh, a, a positive relationship and so far have been working to stop this project moving forward. Well, so to that effect, you guys could, um, your commission could choose to uphold the zoning administrator's approved condition of approval, which actually very much simplifies it to requiring a, a final landscape and irrigation plan um, consisting of landscape screening on the west side of the facility and the east side of the facility. And so you're, if your motion were to support the original condition of approval prior to building permit issuance, the applicant can coordinate with the property owners as agreed upon in the original decision and that without complicating it, I, I definitely support the direction you're going here. Okay, so in, in regard to um, Commissioner Lazenby's concern, this would still involve the, uh, them both agreeing, I'm a little confused myself now. Uh, well, so it would go back to the original zoning administrator condition of approval with regard to final landscaping and irrigation plans. Um, you could add, I mean, adding that language, just, you know, unless you want to be specific to the man's request to require redwood trees and require a minimum of five years of um, irrigation until fully um, established and a care management plan. I, th I think... Well, Commissioner Lazenby just shook her head. She can weigh in on this. I'm not sure that you actually should water redwood trees for five years. So again, this has to be a recommendation for sustaining the uh, viability of the trees that they both, and we talked about having the, um, the applicant agree to it. Do you want to take another stab at formulating the condition if we're going to change it to reflect that simply? Goodness. Um, I'm taking a look at it too. Or do we just go back to the original proposal and simply adding that um, that there is some that both all parties agreed to uh, a stiff, uh, you know, a explicit care and maintenance program as advised by the arborist? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So the language would just be revised to say with all parties in agreement? I, 
I think that, that all parties in agreement still puts us in the same predicament that Commissioner Dan and Commissioner Violante were were raising. Um, there is an agreed um, planting plan and irrigation and, and care plan for five years that all parties agree to. Well, uh, if I may interject, we cannot um, superimpose something that we say they will agree to. They have to agree to it. We can't agree to it for them. Then all parties will agree to a care and maintenance program for five years. Well, that's pretty open-ended if we said a five-year uh, what was it, watering program and a 20-year maintenance is, you know, that's that's something that he was asking for. So we can't say, because they're just going to continue to argue this, not having anything in writing before them. I think we could ask for the arborist who selects the tree species to submit a, a care and maintenance program mm -hmm. That the applicant would agree to uh, to follow, and I don't think a twenty year maintenance plan for redwood tree is makes any sense to me. They don't really need that. If they grow, they grow. A so, care and maintenance pr um, plan as prepared by the project arborist. The applicant's arborist is that correct? Yeah, that would be the applicant. I wonder, Allison and Rachel, how do you, you does that suffice to meet your your desires? If I'm understanding it correctly, I think that it would because it doesn't it doesn't um, require the Showing. talents to agree together on something. I think I think so. If I'm understanding. Shall it. I uh, maybe? Um, I'll take a stab at reading that revised condition. In order to screen the wireless facility from view of adjacent residences to the east and west of the subject property, the existing trees on site shall be protected in place. And I think we need to include, address the screening as well. And planting plan implemented in accordance uh, the planting plan implemented and care and maintenance uh, plan implemented in accordance with the recommendations of the project arborist and should trees die, they shall be replaced in kind. I think that's weird. Hopefully they won't die. They're required to, to keep the, the screening in place. I think already without saying that, um, but um, we can I, I think it's a good point. I think, I see no reason if something happens and one of the trees dies, it okay. doesn't hurt to say they shall replace it. I agree. Okay. So I think that's good language. Does my second agree? Judy? I, I, I didn't hear what you said at the end there, Renee. I said, would you agree to that language? <laughs> I, I would look more for language where we are just stating what it's going to be yes. instead of saying they have to agree to it. I right. believe that that's what uh, Ms. Drake, Ms. Drake's language, uh, I think, achieved that, that goal. Yes. They're required to plant um, the screening and also um, provide care and maintenance for that screening and the existing foliage in accordance with the um, recommendations by the project arborist. Understanding um, and appreciating that um, Mr. Mann and um, Crown Castle have had a good relationship and have been um, cooperating in developing this um, planting plan all along. So I would imagine that would continue throughout this finalization of the arborist report. Jocelyn, okay. but, um, and before you actually said some language that we could incorporate to be in the motion, do you want to 
try that one more time because we need the actual okay. what's actually going to go in, not the explanation of it. Okay, I'll have to try and remember what I read before. <laughs> And it wasn't super articulate. It was a little bit off the cuff. Um, well, we got to get through this, so let's get through this. Yep. Hey. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. What did I say there? In order to screen the wireless facility from view of adjacent residences to the east and west of the subject property, the existing trees on site shall be protected in place and planting and the planting plan shall be implemented and all uh what should we say and all vegetation cared for and maintained in accordance with the arborist recommendations uh as prepared by the project arborist sorry maybe that last part didn't sound good um, should trees die, they shall be replaced. Let's see. I need to fix that last little piece there. You want maybe is there any way doing this on the cuff is always difficult. Do you, yeah. should we have this come back to the consent agenda if we're all I mean what, where do we see on that something? Or we like can, this? or maybe we can just take a moment um to for for Sheila and I to try and yeah. together. Maybe, you know, yeah. we need a little break anyway. Why don't we well take 10 minutes? Okay. Sure. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think we understand. Uh, <laughs> the, my, my, my apologies for the interruption. Uh, Chair Gordon, could I just make one suggestion? Because I, I think it's consistent with the concerns that are raised by the commissioners. Um, if it's now is really the time where you know public comments close, but if it's in relation to the motion that would you know benefit the language of what we're suggesting, if you know I, I would hear it if it's trying to you know change discussion I would I would suggest that's not the appropriate time no it's directly related to the issue uh, okay. in, in in my experience uh, when these issues come up and there are landscaping decisions that need to be made ultimately staff uh, approves or disapproves of the plan and my suggestion is that you impose that condition so that we don't uh, encounter a situation which the commission and my client is concerned about and that is, continuing interference uh, by Mr. Robinson in an effort to delay this project or delay the construction. And so it just seems to me that it would be reasonable that uh, if uh, we have an agreement and the city or the county, excuse me, believes that it's reasonable, they can approve it over the objection you know, of any party. And to the extent that the county has a county arborist that can comment on it, fine. If they required an independent opinion, uh, I, I would ask my clients to fund that if that uh, was a necessary condition. Appreciate that. Thank you. And so with that, for now, we're going to take a, how long do you need in the street? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Um, let's, I think we're required to do a 10 minute break anyhow right. with staff. So let's do 10 minutes. So it's 1147. So how about we, re we uh, reconvene at noon? That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chair. Thank you.
Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Hopefully we can resume. Got okay. it. Did it work out? Perfect. All right, Chair, so we're reconvening. It looks like, are we recording? It looks like we are. Do we have Commissioner Shepard back? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, I am here. Great, okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Um, do we jump right in or do we need to do? Um, sure. <laughs> okay. So I, I think you, um, Sal, <laughs> Sheila, and Joyce Lynn are going to give us some language so we can amend the motion again to reflect their language. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to take a quick break while we looked at that. Um, I am glad we did that because I was attempting to amend probably the incorrect um, condition of approval, but I think we've got a good one for you to consider and work from. Um, and that is an amended condition of approval, and it is condition of approval 2-9, actually, because staff had already drafted some pretty great language here in, in my view, which is... Um, has, here's a suggested, suggested revision to how that one reads, and it's a long one. The applicant shall submit final landscaping and irrigation plans consisting of landscape screening along the west side of the facility and the east side of the facility consistent with the recommended species, with the exception that redwood trees shall be planted along the west side of the facility that was included to address uh, Mr. Mann's concern. Moving on, planting location and planting specifications of landscape screening plan prepared by Helix Environmental Planning dated January 21st, 2022. That, was, that change was recommended by uh, Ms. McDaniel. Further, this report shall be revised to include a maintenance plan that addresses all existing and proposed screening planting. Final landscaping and irrigation plan shall be reviewed and approved by planning staff. So that is something you can consider. Um, that operational condition 4B, which is what I had attempted to amend earlier, actually reads well in, in my view um, as it is. So there are no further um, proposed changes. Okay, so and you have um, you have that written down. So if I may amend the motion to reflect, which I'm going to do, we will we can maybe if anybody wants we can read it again. Otherwise, that's what we are going to do. So, um, uh, Tim, as the chair, may I ask that we I would like to suggest that we amend my motion, uh, which I think I'll just probably read it again. Um, the Planning Commission determined that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and improve application 201372 based on the revised findings and revised commission of, or sorry, conditions of approval, Exhibit C, and as shown on the revised project plans, Exhibit E, with the amendment suggestion to Roman numeral two nine condition as just read to us and stated um, by Ms. Drake. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. You're muted there, Commissioner Lazenby. Okay, you lost my whole thought. No. Uh, yes, I wanted to see language that would kind of dictate to the parties what we expect so that planning doesn't get to be a referee on whether they agree with whatever it was that we decided. And I think this is closest to eliminating that. And also, we don't want to bring any risk to the county. So I think I would second this, second this motion. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. And then did we have any other discussion before we move to a vote? 
Great. Thank you. Sounds like we are ready for a roll call vote. Ms. Drake, please. All right. Uh, Commissioner Violante? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Um, Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Thank you so right. much. Motion passes on that appeal. We have the second appeal. Okay, well, I would like to move on the Robinson appeal recommendation that we staff recommends the Planning Commission determine that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approve application 201372 based on the findings and revised conditions of approval, as, which is Exhibit C, as shown on the revised project plans, which is Exhibit 1E. And are we, are you suggesting, because I'm not quite sure, so I better ask that we add this new condition to this particular recommendation? Yes, it's a condition of approval that will be on the project. Okay, so. then, then I am adding as part of my motion that the revised condition of approval for uh, Roman number 2-9 um, shall be as read by Justin. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Do you have a second on that motion? Well, I I could not support that unless we also roll in reconstruction. I know that there's been a lot of conversation about reconstruction obligations are in such and such document, or but I don't think we have it in ours that the applicant or that AT and T our Crown Castle has to restore the property. Uh, Are you asking, you have to second it first before you can ask for a friendly amendment. We're not supposed to discuss the motion until it's seconded. Thank you. Okay, I will second it and I have discussion. Could staff weigh in on that because I thought that it was my understanding that staff had said earlier that that would be covered. Mm -hmm. Absol absolutely. The um, conditions of approval in your condition, um, condition F and G, as included in your packet, articulate that. G articulates that the applicant shall obtain a demolition permit for removal and site restoration of the existing wireless communication facility at 653 Rebecca Drive. That's already regulated by the use approval for that facility. And otherwise would have gone without saying, but I added that in because it became an issue of contention um, by Mr. Robinson. Um, so it would be subject to the site restoration requirements of those a condition of approval of that facility, but it's there. They'll restore the Robinson site, but it will be consistent with the use approval for that site and whatever agreements the property owner has with Crown. And that's not, like I said, that's not the county's business. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I agree with the document, which we, we don't know. Uh, I, I would just feel a little bit better if there are any parameters that we have or that planning has for restoration. Well, you could add that site under G where it says, and site restoration of the existing facility with WCF at 653 Rebecca Drive, consists consistent with the use approval for 653 Rebecca Drive. And then that way it knee jerks to that use approval. Commissioner Lysenby, does that sound like I, I can go along with that, yes. Okay. Um, okay, well, then I will also amend the motion to include what Sheila just said. Uh, Sheila, would you repeat that as best you can once? So the language condition G at the very end of the first sentence, um, it says at 653 Rebecca Drive at a comma consistent with the use approval for 653 Rebecca Drive. Okay, short and sweet and clear. Thank you. 
Commissioner Lazenby, does that seem appropriate to you or an approval of the amendment? I, I second the, the motion as amended. Great, thank you. Any further discussion from any other commissioners before we move to a vote on this part of it? Okay, great. Let's do a roll call vote, please, on the Robinson appeal. Okay. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. <clears throat> All right, and Chair Gordon? Yes. All right, motion passes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. I, I would just like to commend Sheila on the amount of work this took and, and, and being able to, you know, turn on a dime and, and really be on top of everything. I really appreciate the staff work on this one. It's really first class. Thank you, Renee. The green. Yes. Yeah, it's an enormous amount of, of work you had to do for this appeal, both of them. Thank you. Thanks. All right. And thanks to staff. Yes, thank you to all the staff that worked on this. It's definitely a challenging one. Lots of information and uh, moving so quickly to help us uh, work through the amendments is really critical. So thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, that'll close out item number six today. And we can move on to the next regular agenda items, the planning director's report. Do we have anything to report today? I see. Kaya is with us oh. today. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Kaya, or I guess good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear and see me? I can, there yes. Okay, thank you, good morning. Um, I do have um, one thing that I would like to um, bring the commission up to date with, and that is that our Regional Council of Governments, AMBAG, has completed the first part of the, um, um, excuse me, of the RENA process um, for us. That is, they have published a draft methodology for determining what the um, portion of the region's housing allocation will be for each of the jurisdictions in the AMBAG region. So in the AMBAG region, as you know, it's Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. Um, it was a, an iterative process this year. The AMBAG board had three meetings um, before they arrived on what the methodology will be for making that allocation. The process now is that the methodology is with the um, state HCD, Housing and Community Development, and they must approve the methodology before it can become final. So what I can report is, should the methodology be approved, what our allocation would be in that case. And um, um, the, there were, at the end of the day, seven options in front of the board. What was different this, this cycle than previous cycles is the, um, um, the introduction of using an equity lens um, at all phases of allocating the, um, the regional allocation among the individual jurisdictions. And um, that is called the AFFH, or Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Perspective. So the AFFH had um, controlled about 42% of the of the ultimate allocation. Um, there are different factors that control different percentages, and we receive a certain number of units for each of those um, um, different subjects. So for example, well, um, this cycle, the factors were uh, looking at the number of jobs in the area, the jobs housing ratio, looking at the availability of quality transit. There was a resiliency factor, and then there was the AFFH factor. And by far the largest factor was the AFFH. The result of using that methodology is that the unincorporated counties share 
this cycle is going to be 4634, 4,634 units. That means that it's going to be our job in our housing element to demonstrate to HCD that we have the capacity for that many units given our zoning and general plan and site standards. Um, that's going to be, that, that number is much higher than it has been in the past. To compare, last cycle we had 1,314, and now we have 4,634. So you can have a sense of the magnitude of the effort that it will be to um, find and demonstrate capacity for all of that in our housing elements. Um, the other thing that's important about that is the way that those 4,600 units is distributed among the different income levels. That also was a topic of a lot of discussion and work by the AMBED board. And um, the, the, the summary version is that in the very low and low categories, about 53% of that 4,634 needs to be in, in those categories. And then the other two categories, moderate and above moderate, uh, have the remainder. So we're going to be focused on finding room for something like 3,000 very low and low income units in the unincorporated area over the next housing cycle. And um, it's timely to talk about this today because the RENA number is an important piece of, of um, providing that housing. The RENA number is sort of the basis that we use. And then the next step is um, as you know, our sustainability update of the general plan is underway and nearly ready to be um, um, brought out and to have its public process begin. And um, um, when the planning commission sees that and starts to work through it to make a recommendation to the board on, um, on those policies, um, it will, you, you, you'll be doing that with the perspective of knowing what our arena obligation is. So that, that, that's my report about that, and I'm happy to take any questions. We're going up from 1,300 to 4,000? From 1,314 1, to 4,634. And what's the period of time? What, what's, you know, is this like the next X years or decades or what? Yes, the, the, this is all about... Um, um, what's called cycle six in housing element terms. And that is an eight year cycle. So um, uh, that is our allocation over eight years. And it's of course really important to remember that um, it is our responsibility to provide that much capacity. We don't actually build units, but we have to create a situation where nonprofit and for-profit developers have a situation where they they can um, um, begin to contemplate and then build, you know, and request permits for for that number of units. Last cycle, I think we only we permitted something like seven hundred units or something. Is that correct? So we didn't quite meet our goals in in the last cycle. Yeah, um, we, um, we are currently not meeting the goals in terms of housing production. Um, our housing element was approved and accepted, so we made a responsibility as far as capacity. Um, in none of the categories, including above moderate, right now are the goals being made if we think about where we are you know, in the previous eight year cycle. Um, we have made a, a lot of progress and we've, we've done some affordable units. We've done a couple of sizable um, uh, projects recently. We just finished Pippin 2, which was an additional 80 units and then 57 in Capitola and 7th. So our recent production as a community has definitely been better. And um, we report on that annually to the state that's called our annual, well, it's our, it's our annual report and um, it's online in great detail. We're about to file this year's in April and I think it'll show that, you know, we've, we're a significant percentage of the way in each of our categories, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't predict that we will meet those goals. And so once again, that's an indication of 
you know, we have a much higher goal to meet right. next yeah. round. I but I was, only, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think that only three jurisdictions met their goals in the last. Yes, it, 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 it's a common, yes. <laughs> um, because the, the, the numbers given are frankly unattainable. So what we will do is we will rezone to meet the, the goal, but then it's the county's not in the business of developing housing. So we rely, as Pia said, on uh, developers and our nonprofit housing development partners to do that. And I mean, I will just say that like after the, the county went through this process, whatever that was over 10 years ago, um, there were a number of projects that got built right away, Aptos Blue and um, now I'm forgetting some of the other ones in South County. Um, so, I mean, I would, you know, a lot of times we get beat up on, but I would say the county and our planning department, you know, did their job um, in the last housing element quite well. And so this will, and it was a challenge. Um, so this will be an even greater challenge. <laughs> right. And, and, and so the next, you know, preparing our housing element We'll, we'll be do the bulk of the work next year in 2023. It's due to HCD at the end of December of 2023. And the planning commission and the board are going to be the planning department's partners um, in, in determining and, and creating that capacity. Um, and adjacent to that, it just emphasizes how important it is when individual projects come through to think about their density and the number of units and their contribution to the overall meeting or getting closer to meeting these targets because the way we get there is one project, one development at a time. And, um, and every unit is, is going to matter. And, um, and we'll start to have those discussions about creating capacity when we are talking with you about the sustainability update. Um, it's going to include some, um, um, one in particular, New, new proposed zoning district that w w we're calling residential flex, and that will make it, um, it will make some spaces available for higher density projects. And we're going to need those higher density projects to even contemplate, you know, making space, making this capacity. I just like to ask, are there many other communities facing this same uh, prospect of a huge increase in the allocation? Do you know? Yes, it, this is a statewide issue. Um, um, you know, well, what, what's happened is that in the past, most of the cycles have looked at um, creating capacity for current population growth. And what the state is doing now is saying, we must address our existing gap. We have to address the existing deficit. And that's why these numbers are so much higher. Population growth has, is, is nearly flat in the state but we're trying to address the, the deficit, the existing deficit in housing. So that's why the numbers are so high. They're up about three to four times from last cycle statewide. And, um, and this is our portion of that. So, um, so it's, up, it's up to the counties to consider what capacity they have, for example, uh, water, the availability of water and so on. But that's not taken into consideration by this agency. Well, it, it actually is taken into consideration by this arena process. It is um, um, uh, there are prescribed factors that are considered. Availability of resources is one of them, but nevertheless, there is a fixed number of units that needed to be allocated. Um, you know, we have our. Um, our water situation and, and every community has theirs. Um, Carmel, for example, which is in our region, has a moratorium and they, they, they can't do any new connections until they have new water supply. They also got, a, you know, got their, an allocation. So it's considered, but it is not controlling. What is um, the number you get is a function of various factors and um, resources is just one. Well, that's an interesting situation. I expect all counties are looking at. Yes, and um, there are a couple of, of um, 
regional governments that are ahead of us a little bit in the process. Um, the, the Bay Area, ABAG is a bit ahead of us and some of the Southern California COGS are ahead of us and we can see what's happened in their situations. Um, and it, 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 it's, it, it's very similar. HCD is, is treating the state in, in, um, in similar ways and um, every community has their constraints. We've got ours. Okay, so it's their job to set ambitious goals. It's, it's their job to set the goals. And, 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 and it, it's actually more than a goal, um, Commissioner Shepard. It's, um, it, 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 it's, it's mandated, right? Um, they, we are given a certain share of the state's goal and the Monterey Bay Area government has to find, has to allocate that among the jurisdictions. We don't get to discuss whether it's higher or lower. So um, it's, it's, it's more than a goal, it's a given. It, it's a given. So then our goal is to zone appropriately, I suppose, to meet the need. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing that will be different this cycle is I think, um, HCD, which must approve our housing element, is going to be much more um, um, rigorous about uh, assessing whether the capacity that we think is there is actually there. They're going to apply some market analysis. They're going to determine whether a particular property is really suitable for what we're saying its capacity is. So um, I think we're gonna have to give a very good demonstration that, that we have the capacity because they're going to really kind of subject it to analysis. And that's so, what's due at the end of 2023. Uh, yes, we have to have it to the HCD by the end of 2023. Actually, it has oh. to be approved by our board by the end of 2023. Well, what is our district? You mentioned that Carmel's included in it. Just what, what counties are in it? Monterey and Santa Cruz. We're a two county regional government. Okay. So San Benito so, is in there for some things, but not for housing. So basically they say, this is your goal. This is what you need to meet. And then. Yes, that board, and we have representation on the board, went through a process of determining what Monterey and how Monterey and Santa Cruz County's total number would be distributed among all the cities and the two unincorporated counties. And each of those jurisdictions are represented on the AMBEG board. And the AMBEG board went through this process and um, completed their work on January 12th. So Scott, City of Scotts Valley, City of Watsonville, City of Santa Cruz, um, all have their individual allocations that are not in this number. That's right. This is just for the unincorporated county. This is just for us. Well, it's just um, understood. Yeah, you know, just living in an area where a good deal of the existing house in my district, a, a very large number of existing structures got burned down. I don't, I don't know how to think about this. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that was discussed at great length, you know, when we talk about each each area having its constraints, is that um, for the unincorporated county, we we also have goals of um, of preserving our rural environments and making sure that, well, is it, and, and having our density be along transit corridors to the extent we can do it, um, all, all of that. And, and sometimes you're weighing those things because they they're, they can come into conflict. Um, but the county does have the, the USL, the um, urban service line, and the area that we have available um, is well, the, we will continue to try to, to, con to respect that and concentrate the development within the USL. And we talked about this with um, AMBEG quite a bit, is um, we, you know, we, we want our allocation to be an allocation that we can accommodate close to services rather than creating new pressures on the rural areas. Well, what, I, I guess I'd just ask it. You know, we had over a thousand homes that were destroyed by fire. Do those count as vacant spaces now? Or will, when those are rebuilt, will they count toward the housing allocation? Yes, actually they will. Um, and some of them may even be in the moderate range or they'll be above moderate, but we have targets for those categories as well as the low and the very low. 
And, and do um, and do um do ADUs count as uh, separate counts? They like do count as units for the purposes of the arena. Okay. And that's part of our strategy for capacity is continuing to encourage um, and, and ADUs and make them more and more feasible for people to build because right. so if a lot can accommodate, of the, a, you know, a chunk of it through ADUs. So if we were built close to a thousand homes and 25% of those folks decided to add an ADU and could, then that would be numbers we could account for toward this allocation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we'll see if H, how HCD feels about that. In the last housing element, we were able to count the ADUs we had in the moderate category, making an argument that they're um, more affordable by design because they're smaller. Right. And, um, and ho hopefully that will be accepted again. Okay. Well, that's a lot to take in, and I'm glad we're going to be talking about it a lot. <clears throat> yeah, and um, um, I can actually send each of the commissioners the link to the AMBAG website where all this material is laid out. And um, the thing to know as you go through material is that what was ultimately approved was option Z. There are all these, there are these seven options. They approved <laughs> option Z. So if you look at numbers, if you're looking for the numbers that we have as our draft arena allocation, um, they're the ones associated with that. Great. Thank you for that. That's really important. And uh, glad to hear that is moving. And <laughs> know you have a lot of work ahead of you to get prepared. So, yeah, and that conversation is going to be starting um, um, fairly soon. Next time I talk with you, I think I'll talk with you about. Um, what the public process um, will look like, but um, I can just say that as we bring the sustainability update forward and we have all of the new tools and policies for the public to look at and comment upon, we are going to be really counting on the planning commissioners to engage with that um, because it's, it's a lot of material and we'll be inviting you um, to the public meetings and to the extent that you can really participate, it will be great and it will be able, you'll be able to have a more informed recommendation for the board. Um, so we're all going to be working on this as partners in the next few months. Does the university have any stake in this whatsoever? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Does the University of California at Santa Cruz have any stake in this whatsoever? Or are, do they, are they a player in any way? Right. Um, well, um, they're important and how many students they have and how they house their, you know, what percentage of the housing demand generated with the university, it, it, how that's dealt with is really important, but they are not a jurisdiction. They don't get an allocation and they don't, they don't have a vote on the AMBAG board. Well, if, if they built more student housing on campus, would that come? Um, it wouldn't count per se. But um, their, um, their student population and the number of units they have is factored in to this allocation. And the, it, it, it's factored in through the city of Santa Cruz's um, constraints and characteristics. Okay. So um, when the AMBAG board weighed the city of Santa Cruz, they took into account the effects and you know, the performance of the university. And across the, the two counties, there are lots of institutions like that. So they all get filtered in through the jurisdiction they're a part of. And then I just had one more question. My district particularly has a lot of unpermitted, basically illegal housing, but it's been there for a long time. If we made a real effort to make, you know, upgrade or try to reach out and have an amnesty, try to make some of that housing bring it up to code or whatever it's been done in the past. And we were able to do that so that it could be on the books housing, would it come? Every building permit for a new unit, a net new unit counts. So um, um, how we get there as a community, what programs we put into place, um, those are up to us. So um, we, 
we do have some programs that point toward that now, Commissioner Shepard, mm -hmm. but we do not have an amnesty. Um, we've been successful in bringing um, a number of ADUs that have been built without permits into the permitting fold. And then we also, through the Safe Structures Program, have brought um, a number of structures that are unpermitted but are being rented. Um, we've brought them to a minimum standard of, of safety, but some of them are built where they can't, they cannot get a building permit because they're, um, you know, they're in a setback or it's the second one on a property. And um, so we haven't been able to get them all the way to a permit, but we have gotten some all the way to a permit with specially ADUs. And one part of our plan can be, you know, really trying to get as many permitted as we can, because once they get a permit, they're equal to any other building. Okay, yes, I think that's something to think about. Absolutely. That will be in the housing element. What's the, so next steps for us, you're gonna bring some more information next meeting. And then I think you mentioned, and then um, uh, happy to help, obviously. I think any opportunity to get involved earlier is usually better, you know, so that we can have a big, bigger picture and uh, plan, so. Yeah, so um, the first piece of the puzzle is the RENA allocation. And then um, next time we um, I, next time we talk, I'll be able to bring you the um, the schedule or the proposed schedule for the um, sustainability update of the general plan for that public process, and um, and that's where you know we'll be we'll be asking you to become involved and start your work of familiarizing yourself with all that material. Um, because ultimately there'll be um, a planning commission hearing where you will um, uh, make your recommendation. And we want, because of the schedule, we'd hope to um, have you know, one or two meetings, but um, when you see how much material it is, you could think you could have you know, five, six, you know, long, a large number of meetings, and we just can't really do that. So that's why we'll be counting on you with our help, of course, to familiarize yourself with the material and, and, and have it so that we can have a, um, a, a, you know, a kind of a workable public process about it in front of the commission. And that's not going to be until you know, the summer, I think. There's an EIR that needs to be completed first. So that's what's determining the schedule. Okay, so um, um, we will work together and we will get there and we're really starting now on, on some of the policy underpinnings of the project work that you usually do. Thank you, Pai, I appreciate you. that. Great update. Um, if, the, if you didn't have anything else, then we can go to upcoming meeting dates and agendas. That's all that I had, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Maya. Um, yes, Chair, um, the next uh, regularly scheduled meeting is February 9th. And so far we have two items um, slated for that agenda, uh, a tiny homes study session, uh, coming back to you, tiny homes, and then also a minor cannabis, well, appears to be minor, uh, cannabis amendment, um, amendment to the cannabis um, regulations. Um, and then on the second meeting in February, so far we have um, a reservation for an appeal of, of a project approved by the zoning administrator on Bonnie Street. We might have an item from environmental health as well, a series of code amendments. Um, we're, we're looking at that uh, meeting agenda as well. So two meetings in February lining up and that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much. Um, if there was some public meetings on the tiny homes agenda item that I was unable to get to, is there a recording somewhere that I could access and kind of just listen to how this went? Um, if you want to, um, Daisy is the project planner that's been working on the tiny homes. You can email Daisy Allen, or if you just email me, I can forward her your request. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And am I right in thinking we may need more than one study session on that topic? Okay, so what I'll do is I will just put a placeholder on the second meeting in February as well, and we can see how it goes. Yeah, okay. Any report from County Council today? Nothing to report. All right, I saw well, you. I, I just have to say good luck with uh, this one we just finished. Sounds like we're going to spend some time on that one. Ryan Thompson from our office does code enforcement, and he is uh, he's received all sorts of new information about the status of that stipulated judgment. Okay, good. Thanks, Justin. Great. Well, if we don't have anything else, that's it. We can adjourn. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. You too, Jocelyn. Thank you. Thanks.